All right, welcome everybody. My name is Chelsea V. Davis with Veggies Do It Better. And on behalf of Project Animal Freedom, I wanna welcome you to the second annual Vegan Climate Summit. Yay. Oops. This event could not be more timely with what is happening in our climate around the world. The Vegan Climate Summit is an effort to bring together some of the brightest minds at the intersection of animal agriculture and environmental justice, covering everything from the destruction of the Amazon rainforest to the sixth mass extinction of all life on Earth. This summit presents the perfect opportunity to discover the profound environmental harm posed by modern animal agriculture alongside solutions to this environmental devastation. We have an amazing lineup of highly acclaimed speakers to learn from tonight, but before we get started, I wanna share a bit about Project Animal Freedom and a raffle we're doing. At Project Animal Freedom, we are an intersectional organization that is striving to build a fully vegan Midwest by the year 2056 through a strategic chapter-based system and impactful events like this one tonight. Our vision is to create animal, uh, animal rights communities across the Midwest that build a just world where all animals, both human and more than human, can live here comes my more than human, <laughs> can live safe, happy, and free from the genuine tyranny of factory farms, slaughterhouses, and other animal abusing systems. Our mission is to reduce suffering around the world through education, events, and legislation. But in order to continue this important work, we rely on generous donations from supporters like you. So we're actually holding a really fun raffle that's starting tonight through next Thursday. For every $20 you donate, you will get one entry into winning one of three prizes. And for every $20 you pledge as a monthly donor, you will get five entries. So we have three raffle prizes. The first is the grand prize, which is a copy of What a Fish Knows by one of our speakers, Jonathan Balcom and two shirts from our shop. Um, all of these links to our shop and to donate as well as sign up for our newsletter and check out our website are in the chat and I will share them once um, Dr. Rao starts speaking. The second prize is a copy of On Their Own Terms, Animal Liberation for the 21st Century by our one of our keynotes, Lee Hall who is gonna be speaking second, and one of the shirts of your choice from our shop. And then the third prize is one shirt of your choice from our shop. So now I would like to go ahead and um, introduce the amazing Dr. Silesh Rao. Sil Dr. Silesh Rao has over three decades of professional experience and is the founder and executive director for Climate Healers, a nonprofit dedicated to healing the Earth's climate. Dr. Rao is the author of two books, Carbon Dharma, The Occupation of Butterflies, and Carbon Yoga, the Vegan Metamorphosis. He is also an executive producer of four documentaries, The Human Experiment, Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret, and What the Health and A Prayer for Compassion. Tonight, he will be talking about how we can heal the climate. Um, following each speaker's talk, they will be doing a Q&A. So you will see at the bottom of your screen, there is an option to do uh, submit a question. I will be filtering those questions and asking them to the speakers once they are completed their uh, speeches. And then you'll also see that there's a chat and we definitely recommend as much engagement as possible during this um, event. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Dr. Silesh Rao, and I will hand it over to you now. Thank you, Chelsea. So how can we heal the climate? You know, as soon as we admitted that we are changing the climate of the planet, we assumed responsibility for healing the climate. And actually, healing the climate is an engineering project because it has measurable outcomes and it has a lot of team members working together to achieve measurable outcomes. So anytime we have an engineering project like that, we have to do systems engineering. Systems engineering is a way to understand the problem. And then, um, so you analyze the problem and then you figure out the solution space and then you figure out the optimum solution in the solution space and you go about implementing. 
So let us go about doing this and see what climate change is telling us as an engineering problem. So the first thing we need to understand when we analyze the problem is that we are in an environment, in uh, nature, and in nature, every species belongs exactly as it is. And we have seen that about every other species. An elephant belongs exactly as the elephant is because whatever the elephant does helps the ecosystems of the planet. So the question is, why are we here? What have we been doing for so long? Because we clearly have been doing something destructive for the last 10,000 years. So to analyze that, you have to go back half a million years. Okay? You go back half a million years and set the context in time. You realize that the earth has gone through over a hundred ice ages over the last three million years and humans got control of fire about half a million years ago. So during the ice ages, the temperature varied hugely, varied by up to 10 degrees Celsius from an ice age to a warm period between ice ages. So there were short warm periods between ice ages. And what you're seeing here in white is the temperature, reconstructed temperature of the last uh, 650,000 years. And the white line uh, goes up and down, starting from the right hand side, which is current time. So current time is right here on the right hand side. So a high point here corresponds to a warm period and a low point here corresponds to an ice age. So 500,000 years ago, humans got control of fire. And then 50,000 years ago, we formed partnership with wolves and we spread from Africa throughout the world. We spread from Africa throughout the world. And then in the current warm period, we started doing something. So if you look at the current warm period on the right-hand side, it looks exactly like the warm period that happened three ice ages ago except instead of going down, the temperature stayed flat and then even started going up. So if you look closely at what happened there, you see that we have been heating the climate. That's what we have been doing for the last 10,000 years, heating the climate by cutting down forests and raising animals and releasing methane into the atmosphere. So methane levels matched what was happening three ice ages ago until about 5,000 years ago. Then it started going up. That's the human effect. CO2 levels match what was happening three ice ages ago until about 6,000 years ago. So now it's going, and then started going up. It's a human effect. And so carbon dioxide and methane are greenhouse gases that heat the climate. And we have been meddling with that unknowingly for the last 10,000 years. And so we started heating the climate and we kept the temperature constant. We prevented the Earth from going back another ice age 5,000 years ago. And then over the last 200 years, we discovered fossil fuels and we overheated the climate. So we heated the climate by another 1.1 degrees Celsius today. And now we are facing this choice. There are two possible futures for humanity. We can continue heating the climate and probably then create a Venus syndrome on planet Earth if we trigger runaway climate change. And Venus syndrome, uh, Venus has the same amount of carbon dioxide as Earth in total, but all the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere of Venus. And Venus has a surface temperature of 460 degrees Celsius, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing lives on Venus. So we have the potential to create that on Earth if we continue heating the climate, or we can transform to a climate healing species and we can bring the temperature back to the harmonized setting, and keep it there for the rest of creation. So those are the two possible futures for us. And obviously I'm aiming to work for this harmonized setting, climate healing future. So you ask, how did we heat the climate? How did we heat the climate? We heated the climate by creating a system for us to live in that is based on domination, deception, death, disease, and destruction. So domination of other species, domination of each other, uh, might is right type of thing. And deception, deception meaning uh, we actually promote deception in our system. So we praise those who deceive others and give them rewards. And for instance, you know, if you look at this photograph in the background, it's a satellite photograph of the Amazon rainforest. And you can see that they don't deforest the Amazon rainforest completely. They leave clumps of trees behind. And he asked, why did they do that? It turns out they do that because the scientific convention 
for designating an area to be a forest is if the, forest, if the area has 10% tree cover. So in any one kilometer by one kilometer area, the 10% uh, area is covered by trees, it is designated as a forest. So this deforestation of the Amazon uh, does not appear in maps because it is considered a forest. So that's deception. And death, disease, and destruction, death for the animals, diseases for human beings, and destruction of the planet. That's what we have been doing. That's how we have been heating the climate. And we have been doing this based on a couple of false axioms. The false axiom of consumerism, which is that the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by stoking and satisfying a never-ending series of latent desires. This is what I call the greed is good view. And it creates an infinite consumption model so all the systems modeling of human civilization so far has been assuming an infinite consumption model. And as a systems engineer, I assure you that if everyone tries to consume an infinite amount of stuff, they're all going to die. So there is no sense in modeling that. Okay. And the second false axiom that our civilization is based on is the false axiom of supremacism, which is that life is a competitive game in which those who gain an advantage they possess, enslave, and exploit animals, nature, and the disadvantage for the pursuit of happiness, which is what I call the might is right. Here. And this is what vegans are mostly focused on, okay, the false axiom of supremacism. But both these axioms are pillars of the current civilization, and both these axioms are false. Sustainability is about coming into alignment with the truth. So it's as if we have discovered two false beliefs, like, you know, the sun going around the earth, you know, it's a false belief. And when we discover that that was a false belief and we overturned it, that's when the scientific revolution happened. In the same way, you cannot, you cannot start a sustainability revolution until you overturn these two false axioms, the false axiom of consumerism and the false axiom of supremacism. So as this is why I say we are in a double Galilean moment in the history. We have to overturn two axioms. And we have built two machines to implement these two axioms. The burning machine to implement the false axiom of consumerism and the killing machine to implement the false axiom of supremacism. And in fact, all of human activity can be put into one of these two machines. So we pretty much cover, in our modeling, we pretty much cover uh, human civilization by just modeling these two machines. So the false axiom of consumerism in the burning machine, it's through fossil fuels and industry. And this is what most people focus on. And they want to turn the burning machine. Uh, I mean, they don't want to change the burning machine, but they want to change the fuel for the burning machine. And they don't, they don't do anything about the killing machine. They ignore the killing machine. This is the current uh, uh, dialogue that's going on. And the reason they focus on that kind of solution is because they don't want to change the system, but they want to preserve civilization as we know it. But that's not my objective. My objective is to solve climate change, to heal the climate. So I look at both machines and I'm going to model both machines and show you what the solution space looks like. Now, of course, the, this has gone too far now. So we know that the ice is melting all over the place. This is Antarctica in March of 2022. So we clearly have to solve this very quickly. Um, there was a ice the size of Antarct uh, uh, size of Manhattan that fell off Antarctica uh, in March of 2022. Uh, in May of 2022, the temperatures in India exceeded 63 de 62 degrees Celsius, uh, which is 143 degrees Fahrenheit, and birds were dropping dead out of the sky, and animals were dying in the streets. Fire season is year-round, so it's become so normal that people are playing golf, and there's a wildfire behind. American Southwest. So you can see, you know, that uh, this is it's a crazy season. Now. We have to address this as quickly as possible. And the biosphere is telling us that we have only until 2026. So I don't care what, uh, you know, other people are saying. I'm telling you, my data is showing me that we have only until 2026 to reverse this. So the wild animal population between 1970 and 2010 it got reduced by 52%. It became 58% by 2012 and 68% by 2016. 
which means we are on track to wipe out 100% of wild vertebrates by 2026. And if you look at the land use, the land use shows us that there is a solution available to us, and that is veganism. Okay? Veganism is the foundation of a solution that's available to us. Land use shows that if you take all the land that's being used to grow plant food and you put it in one area, you can fit it inside Australia. If you take all the land that we use for cities and railroads and roads and highways and put it together in one area, it can fit inside Madagascar. Okay. If you take all the desert land, I mean, I put it exactly where it was, where it is today, just in the Sahara. It starts from the western edge of Africa and goes all the way into India and China. So it's one contiguous desert. But if you think about it, that's where the ancient civilizations of the world were. So humans create civilizations and that creates deserts. Okay, that's what we have been doing because we have been in a climate heating civilization. We take all the land that we're using to grow our animal foods and animal foods is only 12% of the food we eat worldwide. And if you take all the land we're using for animal foods, it will cover all of Europe, most of Asia and a little bit of Africa. Biofuels will fill up the bottom half of Africa. Timberland, land that we use to grow monoculture trees so that we can cut it down and use it for paper and lumber and all this stuff. That covers all of North America, all of Central America, and a little bit of South America. Original forest is only the bottom half of South America. And even that includes the deceptive forest that we were taught, that we were shown, right? So this original forest is where most of the wildlife still lives. And this is diminishing every year because we are taking more and more of the original forest and converting it to land for animal foods. And this is why if we go vegan, all this animal food land, most of it will be returned back to nature. And all of the ocean will be returned back to nature. So seafoods, so-called seafood, where we take animals from the ocean and eat them, that's only 3% of the food we eat. And for that, we are destroying the entire ocean. Okay, so, so if we go vegan, not only will all this land that we're using for animal foods get returned back to nature, or most of it, all the, the entire ocean can be returned back to nature. So which is like leaving 80% of the Earth's surface alone and giving it back to nature. And when we do that, we can literally heal the planet. Okay, that's fundamentally the solution I'm talking about. So I created a bathtub analogy to model the solution space, to model the problem and the solution space. So in the bathtub analogy, uh, I'm actually still using the conventions that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uses, even though I have questioned their conventions. Because from a systems engineering perspective, their, their conventions uh, deliberately downplay, the, in fact, the killing machine. So anyway, I'm going to use their conventions. And even with their conventions, I'm showing you that the killing machine is responsible for 90% or 87% of the greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. If you take into account the entire picture, not just look at the narrow focus that they do. And that's what I do as a systems engineer, okay? So in the model, the model, that is the baby in the bathtub. And the bathtub has 1,000 liters of water. And that corresponds to the 1,000 billion tons of CO2 we have added to the atmosphere between 1750 and 2021. So this bathtub analogy I created for UN Climate Change Meeting in Glasgow for COP26. So all the numbers are current as of 2021. So uh, the bathtub has 1,000 liters of water. And it is getting, there are two faucets pouring water into the bathtub. There's a burning machine faucet pouring 35 liters a minute, uh, per minute into the bathtub. That corresponds to the 35 billion tons of CO2 that is being added to the atmosphere every year from the burning machine, according to the IPCC conventions. Then um, there is another faucet from the killing machine. The killing machine faucet is pouring 15 liters per minute the bathtub. 
And that corresponds to the 15 billion tons of CO2 equivalent that we pour into the atmosphere every year, according to IPCC conventions, which again are questionable conventions, okay, because they use 100 year time frame for methane and so on. But I don't want to go into that. I'm going to use their conventions and show them why, show them, show us why we have to address the killing mission. Right. <laughs> now, the burning machine faucet is also connected to the aerosol tank, which has 350 liters of water. And this corresponds to the cooling gases that are emitted by the burning machine today. And those cooling gases are masking about one third of the heating. This is why 350 liters, because it's about roughly one third of 2000 liters. So uh, the model is that when we turn down the burning machine faucet for every one liter per minute that you turn down the burning machine faucet, it opens the aerosol tank and lets 10 liters flow out of the aerosol tank into the bathtub. So that is that's going to take the mask of the cooling mask off. Okay, then we turn down the burning machine. The killing machine faucet is connected to the drain of the bathtub. And right now the drain is, drain is clogged. But the drain has a capacity of 30 liters per minute. And for every one liter per minute that you turn down the killing machine faucet, it opens the drain and lets two liters per minute flow out of the bathtub into the vegan reforestation tank. So the vegan reforestation tank has a potential of 2,000 liters, which corresponds to the 2,000 billion tons of CO2 you could be storing on land if we returned all the animal agricultural land back to nature. Okay? That's a conservative estimate that we have. Totally, land stores three times as much carbon as the atmosphere. And so it's close to 9,000 billion tons, 9,000 liters stored on land. And you can imagine, 40% of the land has very little carbon. If you just bring back the forest, I'm saying at least 2,000 gigatons of CO2 can be stored. That's 2,000 liters of water in the vegan reforestation tank. So this is the setup. And you're a plumber. And you know that if the bathtub is overflowing, it's about to drain, uh, drown the baby, and you cannot take the baby out of the bathtub, you have to shut down both faucets. You know that. You can't have one faucet continuously leaking water and expect the baby to survive. So the question is, how do you set these faucets down? Because if you shut down the burning machine faucet, then you're going to pour 350 liters into the bathtub and the baby will drop. Because the assumption I'm making is that if the uh, bathtub has 1,200 liters of water, the baby is going to drop. That's also a conservative estimate. So that's 20% more CO2 than we have added to the atmosphere. And that would raise it up to 450 uh, parts per million. And we're already seeing uh, tremendous effects of climate change. So I don't know if 450 liters is possible. Let's assume this is possible. Okay? Uh, but that's the maximum. You can't go above that. Otherwise, you're going to die. So what is, what is now, given this setup, what is the optimum solution? It turns out that the optimum solution is to shut down the killing machine faucet today, as soon as possible. Shut it down. And then you can dial down the burning machine faucet over the next 29 years. And the minimum you need to raise the water level of the bathtub is to 1063 liters. You have to raise it to 6% more than what we have today. And then you can drain the climate bathtub and um, save the baby. And in this solution, the optimal solution, the water level will stay above 1000 liters for 33 years. Okay, and the maximum is 10, 16 liters. So for 33 years, we're going to suffer. You're going to have this level of climate change. And then we'll start draining it. So that's the optimal solution. And the baby thrives. Okay? Let's assume the baby will thrive eventually. Now suppose you say, we cannot make the world go vegan today. We, have, we need time to make the world go vegan. And I say, okay, let's say we do it by 2026 in five years. Let's say it takes us five years to persuade everybody to go vegan. Okay. If it takes us five years to do that, it turns out that the water level in the bathtub will go up to 1195 liters. And it will stay there. It will stay above 1000 liters for 36 years. So we're going to suffer more in terms of the total amount of, of uh, climate change that we have to endure and you have to suffer longer You go on for 36 years. Okay. So that is the extra suffering 
that's caused by those who are eating meat and dairy today. And so they have five years to change. So I'm saying, folks, my models are showing that we have to get to a vegan world by 2026, whether we like it or not. This is not you know, what is possible. This is what is necessary. And so now we have to implement what is necessary. If you wait for governments, it'll be too late. If you act as individuals, it'll be too little. But if you act as communities, it might just be enough. So this is a quote by Rob Hopkins. We have to act together. All of us have to come together and persuade our neighbors and our friends uh, that this, we have to do this together. Okay? We have to get to a vegan world as quickly as possible. That's what the, the biosphere is telling us. That's what climate change is telling us. We have multiple lines of evidence saying that we have to get to a vegan world by 2026. So let's do it. And to do it, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. As Buckminster Fuller said, to change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that new model has to be based on the correct axiom. So that's the climate healing phase of humanity. So this is humanity going from the caterpillar phase to the chrysalis phase. So we have to do the climate healing phase and then get to a climate harmonizing phase where we can keep it there. So this curve you can imagine is the uh, average consumption of humanity. And it's not reached a peak. It cannot go any further because there's only a finite amount of stuff on the planet. You can't consume anymore. So now the vegans are peeling off. So we have the vegan contagion model okay, that shows us how the vegans are peeling off the mainstream and starting something new. When we start something new, we start healing the climate. At some point, we are going to make the old system break down. It's going to collapse because it's a Ponzi scheme. And when it collapses, Everyone will get on a ladder and jump off to jump onto our model. So that's how I see the transformation happening. It's a nonlinear transformation. And we have to build the, correct, the new system on the correct axioms. The true axiom of inner peace, the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by seeking it within ourselves, the self-mastery rule, which is basically a finite consumption model. And you would think it's common sense that we have to limit our consumption. Okay? And yet no one has really talked about this. No one has really created a model like this. So we have to create this now ourselves. And we have to do the true axiom of unity, which is that all life is one family, that we each bring our unique skills to give all we can, receive all we need, and become all we are, which is what the vitality code of Dr. Shelley Austin. So both of these together will create the new foundations of the climate healing civilization. And this is the greatest transformation in human history. We're going from a system of normalized violence to a system of normal non-violence. From playing competitive finite games where deception is, is lauded, we are playing, we'll be playing collaborative infinite games where truth is lauded. And we are going to transform from a predator species to a caretaker species. And I think we deserve a new name. We call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, which is Latin for the wise, wise prominent. And I think we need to call ourselves Homo Ahimsa, non violent. Then you can see the civilizational shifts, and you can see it's completely radically different from what we have today. And therefore, it requires a completely radically different system, a different open source economy and ecology throughout the world, where there are no secrets between us. Because as long as there are secrets, we are going to destroy the planet. And this is about tapping abundance. It's uh, you know, if we bring back the trees that we cut, if you look at the tree map, you know, there's so much space that there are not hardly any trees left. But if you bring back the trees that we cut, that's about half the trees that we uh, that were there 10,000 years ago. Then, and if even 0.2% of the trees are mature almond trees, they can replace all of the dairy milk we consume each year. So, so we have a chance to create abundance as we regenerate the planet in this new system. So the seven strategic actions that we are working on at Climate Eagles, number one is education, education, education. Number two is drop SDG 8, which is economic growth, infinite economic growth, and replace it with SDG 18, which is zero animal exploitation. And this is a message, this is something that we are asking the UN to do, because the UN is, is pretending to solve climate change by just growing the economy. 
and we don't want that. We know that, that that's not going to happen. The third is food healers, which is SOL SDG2, which is sustainable development goal number two, which is zero hunger. And let's do that with healthy vegan food. And then we have to work on a constitution to heal the planet because it's a different, it's an entirely different civilization that we are building. We have to create a new open source economy game. We have to get all the religions together and we have to create a new ecology for food for us. Okay, so those are the seven actions we work on at Climate Healers. And we invite all of you to come and join us. Okay? Join us, especially for World Food Healers Day, which is November 19th of 2022, where we aim to feed every human being on the planet on at least one day, a healthy vegan meal. Let's do that. Okay? If you do that as a community, that will make us feel like we are accomplishing something real towards our goal of a vegan world by 2026. And so as a systems engineer, I always start off with something small that I get my team to work on. And that motivates the team for the larger picture. And so for World Food Healers Day, we have a number of uh, founding co-conveners. So we have, uh, you can look up foodhealers.org. So with that, I want to stop. Uh, I also, uh, I'm, I'm in India now and I'm working on a vegan university, which is very exciting. It's about the education, 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 the first one. So we are creating a system based on humility, honesty, health, happiness, and harmony. And to me, that's an amazing thing to be working on right now. Thank you very much. Stop sharing and throw, the, throw it open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. That was wonderful. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the queue. I don't know if it might be easier for you to just, there's just a few. So maybe you could pick one or two that you'd like to focus on. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, monocropping poses many issues too. Soil depletion, herbicide, pesticide use, etc. Absolutely. This is why we recommend food forests. Uh, bringing back to the ecosystems of the planet. And so it's when you create food for us, you're actually creating not food not just for humans, but also for animals. Right. Uh, APCC, IPCC is posing a disaster scenario of four degrees Celsius temperature rise. Well, IPCC is clearly not looking at transforming the system. The IPCC is trying to figure out how to fix it within the current climate heating system, uh, climate heating civilization. And that to me is absolutely impossible. And that's why they're predicting four degrees Celsius. But when you put everything on the table and you say, I'm willing to transform everything, I'm saying, you know, if, we, if a house is on fire, we don't go around with a normal routine of making coffee at nine o'clock and breakfast at 9.30 and all that stuff, right? So we change. When the house is on fire, we get buckets and start pouring water on the fire and then we rebuild the house. And we have a similar situation on planet Earth. So it's... So everything is on the table and we have to really look at how to transform the system. And that IPCC is not willing to do, but I'm willing to do that because I'm a systems engineer. And that's what I do as a living. <laughs> Can all the animal foods actually go back to nature or will some of that land need to go to growing plant-based foods for human consumption? Yes, some of that land will it'll need to go back to plant-based foods for human consumption, but we have to only add 15% to the 85% that we have already. So we have 85% of the food already grown in land that's the size of Australia. So you can just add a little bit more and that will give you all the food that you need. So we're estimating that 40% of the Earth's land surface can be returned back to nature uh, if we all go vegan. And that to me is an imperative because it's, it's like change, the change, you're changing the foundations of civilization from, uh, you know, greed is good and might is right to yoga and ahimsa, literally. Okay, that's what it will be. And so you cannot say, well, let's have a little bit of, of might is right. A little bit of greed is good. It doesn't work. No? So you're, it's, uh, it's really changing the whole thing. How can we honestly create a vegan world by 2026 if the government systems haven't changed? Well, the governments are, uh, they are tasked with maintaining the current system. So that's their job. Okay, so as Benjamin Franklin said, there are three kinds of people. Those that are immovable, those that are movable, and those who move. And the governments are all part of those that are immovable. So ignore them. 
you have to focus on those who move and help them move in the right direction. Because right now they're all being persuaded to move towards just turning off the burning machine. They're not looking at the killing machine. Yet convince them the killing machine is fundamental. You have to shut down the killing machine as soon as possible. That gives you time to shut down the burning machine, right? So you convince them to go in the right direction. You make them go vegan. And then those that are movable, which is the vast majority of humans, will come along. And when we all come along, most of us come along, those that are immovable will jump as well. So that's how transformations happen. And in any species, you need all three of these. So honestly, you know, I see this as a nonlinear transformation and it is nonlinear transformations cannot be predicted. It depends on what each one of us do. We each contribute to making a nonlinear transformation happen. So I say, go for it. Okay, keep at it. You know, when you are pouring water on the fire, if someone is sitting on the sofa in your home, smoking a cigarette and throwing, throwing uh, butts around, wouldn't you tell him to stop? That's exactly the situation we face on this planet. So I assure you that we can do this, but it requires all of us to put our heads together and do it together as a community. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Sorry, my video is not working, so we're just going to go ahead and um, introduce Lee. So Lee Hall is an author who has taken on subjects from anti-terrorism law. That's right. There it goes. Yay. All right. Lee Hall is an author who has taken on subjects from anti-terrorism law to vegan cooking and wrote the vegetarianism entry for the Encyclopedia of Activism and Social Justice. Lee has taught animal law and immigration and refugee law, and in 2014 actually earned a second degree in environmental law with a focus on climate change from Vermont Law School. Lee's work is a bridge between environmentalism and our personal relationship with agriculture, confronting the way animal farming usurps uh, habitat, Lee maintains a deeply fascinating inclusive blog titled Vegan Place, The Art of Animal Liberation. And tonight they will be sharing how climate action and animal liberation are linked goals. Thank you, Chelsea. And thank you to Climate Healers and Selah Shro. <laughs> that was very inspiring. Uh, how is the microphone? All right, great. All right, so if I can remember the green and the screen and the blue, I'm gonna get this screen right up here. Chelsea's taught me this. Okay, are we getting there? All right, I see a thumb up, that's good. Oops, and are we here now? Okay, Chelsea, I can see you, which is really nice. So if there's any issues with the mic or if anybody needs to interrupt, stop, clarify, what have you, please go ahead and let me know because I can see you. All right, um, welcome everyone. My name is Lee Hall. I am delighted to be here with Project Animal Freedom and the Vegan Climate Summit 2022. And I just wanna give a shout out to Project Animal Freedom and, and the importance of getting involved in this Raffle, we looked into the whole legalities of this too, and it's cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, please do support Project Animal Freedom. Uh, they've put, they've brought us together tonight and taken us out of our silos and sort of, you know, brought us together and, and we can compare and contrast and share and hear feedback, which is a wonderful thing. We're usually doing work in our own areas. You're bringing us together. You're also doing a vegan climate march coming up in the year to come where we could all play a part in that from wherever towns and cities we are all over the world, which is fabulous. And you are working on a completely mid, uh, completely vegan Midwest United States. 
I love goals. So this is excellent. Thank you, Project Animal Freedom. Uh, the the uh, talk tonight is climate action and animal liberation linked goals. Sometimes when we're talking with other people about climate, climate disruption, climate catastrophe, climate emergency, um, it gets difficult because maybe we can't remember the numbers, um, but that's okay. That's okay because what's really important is to go ahead and uh, speak with people. And whether you can remember the numbers or not, what's important is remembering the realities. And one basic reality is it's hotter now than it's been ever since the beginning of human civilization. This is the hottest it's ever been, and that's no coincidence. And this is this week, uh, this is the Guardian, and they're talking about France here, but as I saw in the chat forum, people are here from all over the world, and many of you are experiencing this and somehow still attending this session. Uh, this is beyond frightening. Uh, and here is just one example, and this is France and, and Southern Europe, and nearly 2,500 people escaping a blaze and that has already killed hundreds of people. This heat wave has already killed hundreds of people. And what you don't see here is the free living animals whose habitat this is. And this is what we're about as vegans. This is what we need to bring into the conversation. Of course we do. We talk about uh, confined animals and rescuing animals who need urgent care from uh, confined situations. Uh, also, we do talk about the uh, free animals. And I think that's very important because what climate disruption, climate emergency, climate catastrophe is doing is it's taking away their homes it's taking away their lives and it is taking away their ability to evolve on their terms. The most important thing that they have. The reality is that US daily record high temperatures outnumber record lows two to one. So yeah, we talk about global weirding. We're watching the polar vortex, you know, the loosening of the poles, the magnetic peel, uh, fields at the poles because water is seeping underneath the, the poles. Uh, so we're seeing loose polar systems, yes, and we're seeing, seeing a global weirding, yes, but the trajectory of it is because of the heating, right? So the, you, in the US daily record high temperatures, for example, outnumber record lows two to one. Reality, fossil fuel econo uh, economics, fossil fuel economies, plus animal agribusiness, and I don't call it animal agriculture, there's nothing cultural about it, it's all business, uh, put together equal greenhouse gas emissions. You don't need to remember the percentage that which is which because these are so intertwined. For example, with animal agribusiness, it needs more refrigeration than if we were to just be eating vegetables. It needs a lot of fossil fuel driven feed and that feed network is international, it's multinational. So animal agribusiness uses a lot of electricity and it's using more and more electricity. For example, dairy cows don't produce milk in very hot summers. Therefore, what farmers are doing, at least in Pennsylvania where I am, is they're bringing them inside and they're using air conditioning for the cows. So these are uh, intertwined fossil fuel economies and animal agribusiness. Fossil fuels we usually associate with CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, but we also need to talk about methane and nitrous oxide, and those are mainly related to animal agribusiness. Methane and nitrous oxide are extremely potent greenhouse gases, more so than CO2. True, CO2 stays in the atmosphere longer, but then again, that means we can move methane and nitrous oxide out quicker. So that means we have a lot of power on our plate. What we decide to eat makes a big difference because we can make a difference with methane in a way that we can't with CO2. That's very important. It empowers us. So the reality is our species is driving and eating our way to climate breakdown. Very simple. In the previous presentation, you saw 
a mention of ice cores. And this is from icecores.org. And you can go there and see what these scientists are doing. They're going deep, deep, deep down into the earth and they're finding ice from millennia past and they're pulling it out and they're looking at the air bubbles inside those ice cores. And that's how they know that before the industrial Re revolution, uh, the CO2 levels in the air and the atmosphere were 280 parts per million. And now it's 420 parts per million. And it's rising very quickly now. You remember it was just a few years ago when Bill McKibben was talking about 350.org and the whole idea of stopping carbon from passing 350.org? It wasn't long ago. And now we're at 420 ppm. Meanwhile, methane has more than doubled. You don't hear about it as much. That's related mostly to animal ag, and it's mo more than doubled. At the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, countries are being asked to limit their heating to 1.5 or up to 2 Celsius from pre-industrial temps. Uh, can they do that? The, where I am right here, Pennsylvania, I'm at the eastern coast of the United States, North America. Right where I am, we're well over 1.5 degrees centigrade right now of heating. Much of the world is. If you look up in Alaska, for example, they're double that now. Because at the poles, the heating is, uh, it's just on, on steroids, all right? So this is an uneven thing. So what they're talking about is, can we get an average of between 1.5 and 2C? Um, you may think, what can we do? All right, there's so much carbon dioxide in the pipeline. What can we do? And I would say that stopping right now, it's about on the average about 1.1 around the world. Um, I would say that is worth doing every single thing we can do to try because the difference between 1.5 C and then going up to 2. Point, you know, 2 or 2.5 C is it's a devastating difference. We would lose the coral reefs completely. Uh, coral reefs are the home of sea turtles and fishes and lobsters, and they're they're older than the redwood forests. It makes a big difference. Every tiny bit of temperature we can spare makes a difference. This bird is a, uh, is a sandpiper. Uh, the Hudsonian godwit is, is the community of sandpipers, and they're named after the Hudson Bay in Canada. Uh, they're, they built, they uh, create their nests way up north in Canada on either side, so near Alaska or on the east side. And they're fabulous athletes because to get to Northern Canada, they travel more than 6,000 miles from Chile to get there, to nest. And they don't drink or eat or rest on the way there. So by the time they get there, you can imagine they're hungry and they want a nice home for their babies. And at this point in the North, we just talked about what's happening way up by the poles, right? So they lose the insects because of the, the climate, the, the, the summer just snaps so quickly into heat and they lose the insects that they need to feed their, their babies. So when their chicks hatch, 94% of them don't make it. And this is about, this is visceral. This is how it would feel not to be able to feed your babies. We talked last time at the first Vegan Climate Summit about these individuals. So you can see on the left, the great tits, they are in Europe and England. And you can see here, Forbes has a little clickbait here and their headline is climate change transforms these cute little birds into murderous brain eating zombies. Clickbait, right? But you go on there and you do a little research and you find out that that's what's happening. On the right, that's uh, a member of the pied flycatcher species. And they come, the, the great tits on the left, the yellow ones, they're resident birds. They don't leave Europe. So they have a little extra energy because they hang out all year. And so if the summer is coming quicker, they can move around climate. And they can actually have their nests quicker, right? Great for them. But, you know, they're just hanging on too. You know, they're just trying to get by too. They're in, they're in trouble. 
Now you've got the pied flycatchers, they come all the way from North Africa. They don't have any room to work or any energy to work. They have to nest when they nest. Well, what's happening now, because, now because of climate disruption, they're both trying to nest at the same time. That doesn't work. The great tits are not gonna allow the pied fly catchers to have ca uh, tree cavities or uh, nest boxes that people put out to help them survive. It's not happening. The great tits go for the back of their head. And I'm sorry to say, um, they do turn into murderous brain eating zombies. And we're doing this. It's not their fault. This is human driven climate change. By the way, also it is happening in North America with the thrushes. There are different thrushes now, and some are moving northward and upward up the Green Mountains and the White Mountains in Vermont. Uh, and they're they're interrupting other flush, other thrushes, wood thrushes, uh, and moving them out of the way. So this is I'm I'm just giving you an example of many many animals who are going through kind of fighting with each other because of human driven climate change. Um, the bees, the poor bumblebees, right? They're not going through trouble enough. No, we have to bring climate disruption to them. At the University of Ottawa, they are doing research, looking at 66 different communities of bumblebees in North America and Europe. And here's what they're finding out. Global heating affects extinction risk, chances of colonizing a new area, and changing species richness, which means evolution. We're taking that away from them. The whole history of their natural evolution, we're taking that away from them. Wildfires, we all know, they're taught, we mentioned how they're all over the world now in places we never saw them before. And this is earlier this year that was in The Guardian and the title speaks for itself, but let's look at the blurb. The escalating climate crisis and land use change, a bookmark land use change. We'll get back to that in the next slide. They're driving a global increase in extreme wildfires. And look at this, 14% increase predicted by 2030. That's eight years from now. Terrifying. And this is from a UN report involving more than 50 international researchers. This is very much like in the last presentation, a little different. Uh, but this one is from our worldindata.org. And it's a land use map. And it basically tells you, the, the, the different colors tells you how much of the earth are allocated to particular human uses of land. And you can see on the left that appropriately blood red, that color is showing how much animal, how much we allocate to animal agribusiness. Now, granted, most, uh, much of the land, as you can see, uh, ice covered, right? Uh, there's a lot we, we don't, we can't get to, right? We can't use. But so uh, we'll look at uh, animal agribusiness and we can see that flesh and dairy production, as well as uh, grazing feed crops, feed crops, uh, that is taking up 20, 27% of the land use, of what we can get our hands on, you know, through the, of the 100%, we have used 27% on animal agribusiness. And that's more than, as you see, the green area, that's 26%, that's forested. So if we didn't do this, imagine, and, and you know, the, the, the red is getting bigger and bigger and the green is shrinking and why? Because we are encroaching more and more into forest. So the weird thing is people tell us offset your flight, right? Off, for, uh, yeah, as though we can carry it on, right? We can carry on flying to our heart's content, right? If we just plant a tree somewhere, right? And then we've offset. Um, no, the world doesn't want us, the earth doesn't want us to offset. The earth wants us to leave the old growth forests in place so they can do what they evolved to do with the species who evolve with them. That's what we need to do. So offsetting happens on our plate, the real offsetting. Then you look at the lavender on the right, and that is crops that we grow for direct human food. Isn't that a shame? 7% versus 27% that we put to animal agribusiness so that we are indulging in using so much space for feed crops to feed animals we only breed into existence to use and to consume. 
So it's very clear, as Salesh Rao said, how we can shift, just looking at this graph, what a big difference we could make by shifting our diet. Now, going from land use to who is affected by us taking up all that land. And in reality, animals are trying to move to higher elevations and latitude to find cooler conditions, of course, right? But space is limited and we now we know why, because we allocate so much to animal agribusiness. Notice in the, in the middle there, do you see that purple? That's built up area, villages, towns, and cities, and infra only 1% for infrastructure. So we're, look at what we're really doing. We're really using up land that we don't need because of animal agribusiness. So they're trying to find new spaces, but space is limited because we're taking it up with animal agribusiness and because how far can they go without running into other animal communities and fighting with them because of these fights we're causing with global heating. If there's one message that I'd like to make sure that we take away from this, it's that if we're not thinking about animal liberation, we're missing the whole picture. Climate action is not about us. And I'd like us to talk about that as much as possible. And we have loads of chances. We have loads of friends and friends talk to their friends. And this is important. It's not, the earth is not just about us. The climate is not just protecting us. It is protecting all living beings on earth. These are grizzly bears. They live in Yellowstone and they're going through what a lot of the forests are going through in the West of North America right now. It's uh, global heating. And it means that the pine bark beetles can survive most of the year. They used to freeze in the winter, but they don't now. So they eat the pine bark. And that means the pines are dying. They're just, forests are just massively dying out. And what this means is that these grizzly bears can't feed their babies what they want. And that's those inner seeds from the pine cones. So they're already hanging by a thread, grizzly bears, but now we are starving them out. What a reality, just look at one company, one animal agribusiness corporation. Take Tyson Foods. Yes, it's a giant. It processes, hi, that was, that was Chris you just heard in the background. Hi, Chris. Uh, Tyson's food processes 2 billion animals yearly in the United States. 2 billion animals yearly. Using feed cropland, nearly twice the size of New Jersey. That's what one corporation can do to what could be wildland where other free living beings could survive and thrive if we'd only let them. You know, on Twitter, and I hope you join me there at Vegan Place. Now and then, I don't do it all the time, but I try and I need to do it more, so please encourage. <laughs> this is uh, someone named James Rebanks, as you can see, or Herdy Shepherd One, um, who loves to see the photos of native breed cattle from the 1950s and 60s. These are basically what the regenerative grazing experts say we need again. And so I have to converse, and I have to say, these quote unquote native breed animals are products of selective breeding and not part of any natural bio community. And I quote a paper in the literature, in the scientific literature, organic beef lets the system down, published in 2020, suggests that avoiding flesh products totally is preferable to organic grazing for hashtag sustainability. And I give the site. And then you see hashtag SDGs. You'll remember from the last presentation, that is sustainable development goals. It's a UN catchphrase that is extremely uh, getting a lot of tension all over in countries all over the world, SDGs. Um, I was asked and I did contribute to the UN Encyclopedia on Sustainable Development Goals because I wanted to write a chapter on non-human rights and human sustainability so that I could bring in these kinds of questions, right? The rights of non-humans to 
experience their birthright. And it talked about veganism and so forth. So any opportunity that we can get into these conversations about sustainable development goals, I think we need to insert ourselves. And also, I think we need to remind people that when they're talking about biodynamic farming or free range farming or regenerative grazing, and they're saying it's so great, it brings nitrogen back into the soil, da 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 da. I think we need to remind them too, not only of these papers that do say otherwise, uh, but I think that we have to also point out that, and here's an example from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources website site that the states and the nations are waging war, and I don't use that term lightly, are waging war on free living animals because of our purpose bred animals who are out in those so-called free ranges, all right? They're confined and on the outskirts of where they're confined are the free living animals who would live there. But we have people dressed for war going out and uh, coyote hunting to help a local farmer is what the website says. So we need to keep in mind that this is not, again, this is not all about us. This is also about the free living animals. And I spoke to AOC, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez on uh, Twitter yesterday, who was talking of regenerative grazing and had a, a, a congressional hearing and, and, and was holding court on how great it is. And I was talking to AOC about uh, the importance of recognizing that we need to stop the war on free living animals. And as long as we have this free range grazing idea, we'll never be at peace with the bio communities, the, the indigenous animals uh, of the lands. And so uh, I think I'll wrap up on a nice one, a save the best for last. This, these summer rolls I learned how to make at Sudao Cafe. It's a vegan restaurant that's very close to me. I can ride my bicycle there. And the owner, Susan Wu, taught me a lot of different vegan foods that I can make, including some vegan foods that don't need cooking at all. So they're very low in energy use. And so I've learned different styles of cooking. And I believe that the vegan cookbook or Bringing, inviting people over for lunch or what have you is teaching. And this is where we need to be going. And here is a scientific journal that underscores the importance of this. It's climate change, uh, a climatic change is the journal and the title is, and I like that it has vegans in the title, dietary greenhouse gas emissions of meat eaters, fish eaters, vegetarians and vegans in the UK by Peter Scarborough et al. Peter Scarborough being a well-known food systems and climate researcher. Uh, so this, uh, this is a good one to cite and there are many more that are coming out more recent uh, that say basically this. This is an Oxford study, including some more than 60,000 individuals that it, were involved in this research. And the conclusion was dietary greenhouse gas emissions and self-selected meat eaters are about twice as high as in vegans. What power are dietary emissions? We can cut in half and we can talk to other people about their power. We the people do have the power, a certain amount. And why shouldn't we be wielding it as soon as possible to the fullest extent that's possible? Some people in the world don't have the privilege to go vegan immediately, we do. And I think that's part of the conversation we are having with our friends. Why, if those of us who do have the privilege to go vegan, yes, we can do it overnight. We can do it overnight. And I think that is very, very good news. And I think we're all here tonight to share it. And I'd like to thank everybody who made, who shifted my time to do this kind of work. Project Animal Freedom, and also the patrons of the art of animal liberation at patreon.com slash Lee Hall. All of you, uh, Project Animal Freedom is included in my patrons and I'm so proud of that. All of you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for allowing me to put so much of my life into this work. This is what 
there's nothing more important. And the more and all the minutes that I have and all the minutes that we all have collectively. Go team. Thank you so much, Lee. That was amazing. Um, so we have one minute. <laughs> so there are three questions in the queue. Uh, I don't know if you can see it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen there. You can click on that and the, the questions will pop up. And there's three different ones if you'd like to pick one. Real quick. OK, I'm sorry that there's only a minute. Uh, I did put this slideshow on patreon.com slash Lee Hall, and I welcome all the questions <laughs> if there's a common field. Um, would animal agribusiness also include the, I see I had 25 minutes. So I don't know, I mean, I used it. Uh, would animal agribusiness also include animals that aren't used for food? Yes, it would. USDA, for example, has control over the animals in labs. Um, all animals that are raised, that are bred for human use, uh, I would consider that part of world animal agribusiness. So thank you for bringing up that question and the importance of respect for animals uh, who are stuck in all kinds of confinement at the hands of human beings. How to get to the politicians like AOC to go vegan, I know, right? Um, let's get on Twitter, okay? Because AOC is a big tweeter and you know, I think that's best right now. Someone asked in the chat what AOC said. AOC said, I don't know. We got to keep working on it because AOC was kind of trying to make AOC's point. Um, so if there's enough people saying, AOC, did you listen to that question? You know, what about the war on indigenous animals? Shouldn't we be talking about that? Um, what about the deforestation, et cetera, et cetera? Let's do it. You know, let's let's keep talking to them. Bernie Sanders is one. Bernie Sanders talks about, uh, well, it wouldn't be that expensive, you know, compared to wildfires if we just did the Green New Deal. And then I talked to Bernie Sanders and I said, you know what, it wouldn't be that expensive to shift our resources to animal agribusiness and shift subsidies, right, away from animal agribusiness to vegan organic growing, for example. That's a shift. It wouldn't be that expensive to shift our resources from cars to trains and walkable towns, right? A attractive mass transit, right? That's not really, why are we talking about how expensive it is? Let's talk about shifting our resources. Let's talk to them. I agree with you. We need to get their attention. Thank you. I think I my time is up. I must have started this late. <laughs> this time or late. So, well, that's okay. It was also me introducing you and everything. Um, if you want to take one more minute and answer the last question, I don't want to stop you. Is there one more question on here? Let's see. Is it it's for you, Chelsea? Can you give us an idea how many are currently tuned into the Zoom conference? I know there's more than 100 people. Um, that's what I'm seeing, but maybe I'm looking at no, nope, you're right. Chat. The two questions were kind of similar, so I apologize. Okay. Uh, so to answer Paul's question, we currently have 112 people tuned into the Zoom, and then we have a number of people watching live on Facebook, which is oh, oh awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done, Project Animal Freedom. Well, and well done to our speaker list. This has been amazing so far, and we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, okay, so now we're gonna transition over to Jonathan Balcombe. Jonathan Balcombe is a biologist with a PhD in ethology, the study of animal behavior. His books include Pleasurable Kingdom, Second Nature, and What a Fish Knows, a New York Times bestseller now available in 16 languages. His latest book for grownups, Superfly, won the 2021 National Outdoor Book Award for Natural History Literature. And he also recently came out with the children's storybook, Jake and Ava, A Boy and a Fish. Jonathan has appeared in several films and television programs, including Seaspiracy and the 2021 documentary on, aquarium, on the aquarium fish trade, The Dark Hobby. Tonight, he will be sharing with us what a fish knows. Thank you, Chelsea. Let me share my screen. So I'm representing the fishes tonight. It's an honor to do so to this audience. And uh, sorry to show this slide as an opener, but it's one of the two 
broad context that we so often think about fish and place them in our society. And the other one is, is a source of recreation. Fishing is a big deal. I live on Lake Ontario in Southern, in Southern Ontario, and uh, it's a, it, there's a lot of fishing going on around here, I can tell you that. But today I want to encourage you and share with you some a different context for fishes, looking at them from their own perspective. <clears throat> First thing I want to mention is just the incredible success of fishes as a group. It's a very diverse group. In fact, if you all of the birds and mammals, reptiles and amphibians, all of the other vertebrates combined don't equal the number of species of fishes in the world today. <clears throat> There's two main groups with the bony fishes and the cartilaginous fishes, and almost all of the all but two of the ones here are representatives of the bony fishes, but the shark and the electric ray at the top left, near the top left, are in the cartilaginous group. And it's, I just want to impress upon you that, that those two groups are so distinct. They're as distinct as birds are from mammals. And as you might expect from such a, such a diversity of, of creatures and species, there's a, quite a few superlatives among, among vertebrates that go to the fishes. Uh, this species used to be, it is no longer the smallest known vertebrate, a little fish of Philippine lakes. Uh, if you put 300 adults on one side of a scale, I don't encourage you to, I wouldn't want that to happen to them. And a, an American penny on the other or a Canadian penny, the penny would go down, they're that tiny. And the record, current record for longevity in a vertebrate animal goes to the Greenland shark. Uh, there are some Greenland sharks currently swimming under the Antarctic ice uh, in waters there who were probably alive before Shakespeare started writing his plays. So we're talking in the realm of 400, possibly 500 years old. Fishes, do they have minds? Yes, they do. Do they think? Yes, do they do. Do they do clever things? They certainly do. And I want to just give you a, a few couple, a handful of highlights. Uh, there's many more, by the way, I could mention, but these are just some that, that, that time permits, hopefully time permits. Uh, tool use. This is a, an example of tool use in a fish. By the way, many of the phenomena I'll, I'll mention today you can see YouTube videos of these things. This is a tusk fish who has used water as a tool to blow sand away to uncover, uh, a, in this case, a clam. And then the fish picks up the unfortunate clam and swims off with it to a very particular rock or piece of coral, probably a favored spot for this behavior. And then with a series of well-timed and head flicks and releases is able to eventually, it's not easy to do, to eventually smash open the clam and get at the soft uh, tissues inside. Note also the opportunistic by swimmers or by, 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 by yeah, bystanders or by swimmers, the fishes on the left. Fishes are alert, they're aware, they're opportunistic, they're looking for an opportunity to get some of the spoils. You may have heard fishes being demeaned as having a very poor memory, the, the infamous three second goldfish memory. What a load of crock, what a crock of load. Um, this is a frill finned goby. And, uh, and this is about a four or five inch long fish of the Atlantic's coastline. And this fish certainly puts the lie to the idea that fishes don't have good memories. Uh, the fact that fishes recognize each other and recognize other things, as I'll mention shortly, that requires long-term memory in itself. But these fishes do something quite remarkable. They live in the tide pool zone and they can jump accurately from one tide pool to another. How do they know how far to jump and which direction to, to get away from an octopus or a heron? How do they avoid making a leap of faith and ending up stranded on the rocks. Turns out they memorize that reef, reef zone, that intertidal zone uh, when the tide comes in. So they can swim over it, swim down among the nooks and crannies and make what's called a mental map, uh, a detailed memory of that space. And they're able to translate that sort of aerial view, if you will, into a horizontal view when it's low tide and they can jump accurately. Studies show that they can memorize a tide pool zone in one day and they can remember it 40 days later without any intervening experience with that tide pool zone. So, uh, you know, sometimes I have trouble remembering where I put the remote in my, in my apartment. So uh, these fishes are doing pretty incredible things with their minds and great memories. Another example of tool use is the use of water as a projectile, which the aptly named archer fishes do. There's about six species of these fishes and they all can learn and learn is an operative term here. They, they actually have been shown to learn it by observing others doing it to they learn to squirt water at insects perched above the water or flying by and they can, that's a, that's an extra challenging skill to hit 
a, a flying insect with a projectile of water and studies show and observations show they, they're flexible in this. Uh, if the insect is flying close to the water within six or seven inches, say, the fish rotates at the same time, at the same rate that the insect is flying and squirts water directly at it. But if the insect is higher up and further away flying, then it uses more of a football quarterback or soccer kicking a ball passing approach where they actually aim ahead of the insect and uh, to, to hopefully hit it and bring it down hopefully from the fish's perspective that is and other studies show they can control the where the where the bolus of water at the tip is is most has the most force how big it is so suffice to say there's, a, there's an enormous amount of nuance and sophistication with this behavior and because archerfishes squirt water out into the air, scientists thought, well, they're, they're really appealing fish to use in studies uh, of, of where you present stimuli over the tank. You look on the right panel here, this is a touchpad. And so by presenting, for instance, faces on touchpads, you can test the old, age old question of, can a fish recognize a human? Many fish keepers think that they can. And in fact, it turns out they can, even if you return, remove the, the hair, uh, as on the left panel or the ears in the middle. These faces look pretty similar to me, but these fishes, uh, when they're rewarded for squirting water at a familiar face, you can put one familiar face among 40 unfamiliar ones and they will squirt at the one. By the way, I'm not necessarily endorsing these studies, um, just a disclaimer there. Uh, these studies have been done by other scientists and uh, whether or not we should do these kinds of studies, the fact that they're done, if, if I feel if we, we may want to mention them because they can help us to appreciate the abilities of these animals since they've been done already. Fishes actually fall for optical illusions, which I think is a very re revealing finding. Uh, this is the this is the Ebbinghaus illusion. It's one of a number of illusions that fishes and other species of non-humans have been tested on. And the two orange dots are the same size, but because of the arrangement of blue dots, in this case, the one on the right looks larger than one on the left. If you train a, a bamboo shark or a, a, another kind of fish to with a reward every time they poke their nose up against the larger of two circles and then present them with this in a randomized fashion, and then, and then see what they do. They will, they will in this case, poke the dot on the right because they, like us, perceive that dot as larger. Now, if they were robots, and if you tested a robot in, on this, the robot would have no difficulty in recognizing that the two orange dots are identical in size. But fishes are not robots. They're biological entities. They're individuals with, who are, have, can have beliefs. And like us, those beliefs can be fallible. Fishes live together, they live with other fishes. And uh, here's some examples of some of the nuances and sophistication of that. Here's a fascinating interspecies interaction example involving two large reef predators, a moray eel on the bottom and a grouper on the top. And particularly in the Red Sea, but I think some other locations now, it's been seen that these two will team up and hunt together collaboratively. Their success rate by doing that is about five times higher than if they hunt individually. And that involves a, a complex social signal by the grouper, more than one kind of signal actually. There's a head shake, which is the grouper's way of inviting the moray eel. The grouper will swim over the moray eel's lair and do a head shake, which is, hey, come fishing with me, come hunting with me. I want to get, we want to get some food. And um, sometimes the grouper will also point by, by swimming face down and just hovering there in the water, essentially pointing to the moray eel, pointing at a prey fish who swam into the matrix of the reef. It works because the moray eel can get into that, those narrow nooks and crannies where the grouper can't. And if the poor fish escapes the moray, swims out into open water, well, you know who's waiting. And studies done at uh, Cambridge University with fake moray eels laminated between layers of plastic on a, on a wire pulley where the scientists could control how cooperative the moray eel is. Those studies show that groupers remember a, co a cooperative versus an uncooperative moray from the day before. And they will, of course, preferentially select a cooperative one. So this is not willy-nilly relationships. These are long-term relationships built on uh, past experiences. One of the best studied social interactions and, and um, mutualisms of, of any animal is the so-called cleaner client mutualism of reefs where you have more than 100 known species of 
client fish, so-called client fishes, and they don't call themselves that, we do, uh, who line up to wait their turn to get serviced by, in this case, two blue striped cleaner wrasses who swim into the mouth of this little predatory fish with impunity. It doesn't tend to lend itself well to business relations if you eat your business partner. So the, the clients don't, don't eat them, of course. And the bold cleaner rats is swimming out of the gills, removing sea lice and other parasites and algae and other undesirables from the skin. Um, sometimes they don't do as good a job and it's been shown that they they are, tend to be more shoddy in their performance if there are few other fishes in the queue. It appears that they are aware that their eBay ratings are going to suffer less if there's fewer witnesses. If there are a lot of fishes waiting their turn, they tend to do a better job. One of the ways they do a bad job is to mucus nip where they actually may take a little bit of that slimy outer layer, protective layer. Client fishes don't like that. It, it tends to make them jolt and the cleaners may uh, try to mollify the upset client by fluttering their pectoral fins to make them feel good. Suffice to say, it gets Machiavellian. Uh, and that's not just my term, that's uh, a term used by some other scientists to describe this behavior. Can fishes be virtuous? Absolutely they can. Here you have four species of rabbit fish, uh, a pair in each case. And rabbit fishes are vegetarians. Uh, they feed on algae in the reef. And it's a little bit hazardous to have your face down in the reef feeding on algae. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a lookout? Well, you can see in each case here, there is a lookout. There's another one of the same species looking up, keeping an eye on the surroundings, ready to alert both fishes if, if the trouble comes along. As you may guess, they switch every couple of minutes or so. So both fishes get to eat in greater safety by being cooperative and virtuous than if they foraged alone. Can fishes have aesthetic tastes? Can they appreciate art? Well, this little puffer fish, uh, south coast of Japan, discovered only recently, he, the male makes this beautiful six foot Mandela pattern uh, over the course of hours and maintains it over the course of days. Uh, and that indicates uh, he does this to attract a female. This is a, a sexual selection example where generations of choosy selected females preferring males with good artistic skills have favored uh, the fish equivalent of a peacock's tail in, in birds. And they lay their eggs in the middle and, and sprinkle them with bits of shell and hide them under little pebbles. And then, uh, and then the genes for artistry in the male are, tend to be favored and passed on into the next generation. A little bit about fish emotions. You know, there's a lot, a lot more that scientists are studying about emotions now than they were before, and that's that's encouraging. Do animals have emotions? Absolutely, they do, uh, across the board. Um, so here's a striated surgeon fish. Uh, again, this is not a very nice study for the fishes. I'm, I'm happy to say that the scientists. Uh, re were able to successfully release them all back into their homes on the Great Barrier Reef after the study was completed. The fishes were caught, they were stressed, they were put in a bucket of shallow water for 30 minutes. That cannot be very nice for a fish. And uh, you can, how do you tell a fish is stressed? Maybe from the behavior, but you can also draw a little bit of blood from the tail vein and measure cortisol, blood cortisol, which is what they did. These were very, very stressed fishes when they were put in one of two tanks. In the top tank, uh, they were they were with a, a, a very realistic model of a blue striped cleaner ras uh, that could was attached to a motor and therefore could give sw swishing movements and could caress them could give them a stroke if they swam up next to it and the control group in the bottom there was no motor attached to the ras so they couldn't get those strokes and these stressed fishes re reacted incredibly differently to, depending on the treatment in the top situation they swam up to that that and got strokes from that model cleaner ras an average of 15 times an hour and in the bottom situation where they couldn't get strokes zero times an hour so highly significant result um, it's it what it demonstrates is fishes not only can get stressed but they 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 have the wherewithal to seek out stress relief by getting a massage essentially is something that we know is can be stress stress relieving for us as well i mean most people would would not believe this kind of complexity in social complexity, behavioral complexity, emotional complexity uh, in many animals, never mind fishes. And I shouldn't say never mind fishes because that, that just plays into the old bias that they're the, they're the least sophisticated. Uh, far from it, one of the take home messages here, I hope, is that fishes are full members of the vertebrate group. They have every, they have every capacity that the uh, terrestrial vertebrates show, perhaps even more in some cases. 
And just an example of, a, of an anecdotal example of, of, a, of a NASA grouper here who approaches a trusted diver. I've seen other examples of this. You can see tons of YouTube videos on fishes who appear to enjoy getting stroked and caressed, and they'll come back for more. There are sharks who befriend divers who will swim up to the trusted diver. Christina Zanato, a well-known dive instructor on the left here. They know her. She has names for these gray reef sharks. They've known her for years. They swim up and rest their head on her lap and they'll get caressed. They appear to love that. And in that stress-free state, uh, divers, uh, compassionate divers will use bolt cutters and other tools to remove hooks from the shark's faces. This is a blue shark in another setting. And that hook shortly after this photo was taken was successfully removed from that blue shark. Uh, the blue shark hung around. Gratitude in a shark, uh, we shouldn't dismiss the possibility. Boredom in a fish, we shouldn't dismiss that possibility either. A study showed that fishes who were bored and housed in a, alone, uh, they would start to interact with a semi-buoyant thermometer. Uh, this theory and, and the, the interaction fit all the criteria for play behavior. So this may be a case of relieving boredom by playing with an object that's available to you. All right, I, I know I'm going pretty fast here. Uh, and I apologize if I'm sounding like a freight train, um, but uh, I wanna finish up now with the troubled relationships between fishes and humans. We've tended to be alienated from them for the simple fact that we live and have evolved on land and we breathe air, they live under the water. So that's uh, been a disadvantage for them. We don't hear the sounds they make. They make tons of sounds. They have many ways of making sounds, but they're, they're evolved to propagate underwater. And uh, they also, you know, they don't blink. So we think they're, they're, they're not feeling much, but their eyes are constantly bathed in water. They don't need eyelids. Some of them have nictitating membranes, which are clear. We just don't see those. Uh, so they've had the misfortune of being uh, a little bit left out, left behind from our sensibilities through history. Um, we're now realizing there's so much more to them when, than we thought. And you can read the, the, the slide here for yourself. It's a, it's, a, it's a recurring pattern. Here in Canada, they just declared the monarch butterfly is officially endangered yesterday. That's a butterfly. We're talking about fishes here. Uh, you could say the same thing for insects at large, huge declines because there's too many of us and we're causing all kinds of disruptions in the planet vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the vegan climate uh, focus of this, of this summit. So there's a number of existential threats facing fishes, climate change, global warming, ocean acidification, coral bleaching, plastic pollution, 640,000 tons a year of plastic of uh, Fishing nets discarded or lost, an estimate according to one study, uh, and they continue to catch animals long after humans have stopped using them. Uh, also, the insidious related problem of microplastics, which fishes think are eggs and they can't digest them and they can perish from that as well. But far and away, the biggest negative impact we have on animals is our dietary choices. Almost all of the animals humans kill are to be eaten, which is probably why these two things are the most dangerous weapons on the planet. And no one knows how many fishes individually, but by extrapolating from the weights, because that's how they're measured is in millions of tons, uh, anywhere from a low of, hundred, of a few hundred billion a year to over one to two trillion fishes a year are taken by humans. Unfathomable numbers, so easy to forget that they're all unique individuals. Everyone is a unique being. And not only is fishing cruel because of the crushing in the nets and the, de in the, de and the decompression coming from the depths, um, and the suffocation, et cetera, but it's also terribly inefficient. This is a that was a shrimp shrimping vessel net catch, and you have to look pretty hard to find any shrimp there. The shrimp industry is particularly notorious for so-called bycatch, uh, non-target species who, like this, end up dead or dying on the deck. So it's a very, very cruel and wasteful industry. Aquaculture sometimes claimed to put to relieve stress on wild fish populations because uh, because they're in uh, captivity they're not in the ocean but in fact uh, most of the fishes people like to eat are predatory they need to be fed and uh, most of what is fed to them is wild caught menhaden uh, anchovies and other small fishes like that so it doesn't take pressure off wild populations there's a lot more i could say about aquaculture but i only have about an, a one more minute left so um, the, this is a speaks to the inefficiency of eating high on the food chain uh, you can read it for yourself you can see how inefficient that is and you may have heard that the entire transportation sector 
produces less greenhouse gases than the entire uh, animal agriculture sector. And this shocked me to learn this statistic here from a, a, rep, a prestigious journal. Uh, you can see the numbers, wild animals are just simply being pushed out. This is terrestrial, it's not including fishes, uh, but you saw the earlier slide about declines. Uh, so the situation is, is dire and we need to act now to change things. And then to act now, one of the best things we can do as individuals, of course, is make more sensible choices, more compassionate choices in what we eat. If you've been to the supermarket in your neighborhood and in our part of the world, at least, these are widely available. This is not health food folks, but it's it's very delicious and it's very fish-like from my long-term memory of over 30 years ago when I last ate a fish. Uh, another plant-based company based in Israel um, producing very, very fish-like products. Blue Nalu is, a, is an, an example of a country not going plant-based, but rather using the cell culture approach. These companies are being funded to the tunes of tens, and in some cases, I think even hundreds of millions of dollars. Back to the original theme of food and recreation, uh, just a little plug for my first children's book. Um, if you if you want to give a book to somebody about how that, that, it, that, that legitimizes and, and uh, the compassion that kids often feel when they see fishes caught as children, this is a book that can help to validate those feelings, which I think we need to do. Finally, um, if we live in a planet where we're kinder to animals, we're kinder to each other. It's indivisible, that principle. And so I encourage that. That's the kind of planet I want to live on. Let's keep working to get that to happen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. The chat is going crazy. Everybody is really enjoying and valuing your talk. Um, we do have a couple of questions and we have about three minutes. So I don't know if you'd like to choose which ones you would like to address. Uh, do you want to just read, what, do that choosing for me, Chelsea, if you don't sure. mind? Um, Thanks. You have 98% on the screen. Does this mean that 98% of the stress on fish in the oceans include plastics and oils is from being our, or is it from being from our consumption? Yeah, I, I, I didn't explain that slide very well. Uh, the 98% refers to the percentage of animals killed by humans who are killed for food or killed for us to eat. So that, that's just another way of saying that the, the, by far the greatest impact, negative impact we have on animals around the world is is through eating them. And then another great question is, what's a good one minute elevator pitch uh, to get fish eaters to reconsider their seafood habit? You caught me off guard right with that one. It's a great question. I would just say, read what a fish knows. Um, you know, that I would just say that fishes are, if you like cats and dogs, you should like fishes because they're just as sophisticated, just as complex. That's a wonderful answer. And I also put Jonathan's website in the chat for people who want to learn more about him and see um, what his project current and future projects are. All right, now we're going to go over to Lori Marino. We are so honored to have Lori join us. Lori Marino is a neuroscientist, an expert in animal behavior, intelligence, and self-awareness who was on the faculty of Emory University for 20 years. She is the founder and president of the Whale Sanctuary Project and executive director of the uh, Camellia, or Camilla, sorry. Camilla, <laughs> Camilla. Thank you, Camilla. I even <laughs> wrote it out phonetically and I still messed it up. <laughs> Thank you so much for correcting me. Um, Camilla Center for Scholarship-Based Animal Ag Advocacy, Lori's scientific work focuses on the evolution of the brain and intelligence in dolphins and whales, as well as primates and farmed animals, and on the effects of captivity on wildlife. She has pub published over 140 peer-reviewed scientific papers, book chapters, and magazine articles. In 2001, she co-authored a groundbreaking study demonstrating the first conclusive evidence for mere self-recognition in dolphins, Lori has also appeared in several films and television programs, including Blackfish, Long Gone Wild, and Seaspiracy. Tonight, she will be presenting Eating Someone, The Deep Psychology of Eating Meat. Well, thank you very much, Chelsea, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan, for a fantastic talk. And uh, what I'm going to do to start my presentation is, is share my screen. So here goes.
I hope you can see that. Okay, so today I wanna to talk about eating someone, the deep psychology of eating meat. And I wanna mention that um, this is work that I've been uh, doing with Michael Mountain. Um, and we're, what I'm gonna do is do something a little bit different today, kind of take a deep dive into um, who we are and, and ask some questions about why it is that we interact in the way we do with other animals. So in the last few decades, unfortunately, there have been greater and greater efforts to promote animal protection, but animal abuse and killing is actually increasing worldwide. And I hate to be the bearer of, of news like that, but it is, it is very much the case. Meat eating is increasing worldwide. I think that, you know, as vegans, vegetarians, and so forth, we might get the feeling that, you know, uh, you know, everybody is vegan or vegetarian, and that meat eating is, is, da is down. In fact, it's actually up. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN reports that between uh, 1990 and 2009, global meat consumption increased by almost 60%, and meat consumption is expected to continue to increase by 15% by 2027. And going uh, towards what Jonathan was talking about, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States has shown that more than 85% of the world's fisheries have been pushed beyond their biological limits um, and continued overfishing of the oceans has led uh, to the dim prediction of a global fisheries collapse by 2048. And of course, that's a fisheries collapse, uh, the collapse of, a, of, a, of an industry that depends upon killing individual animals. So it's not just about the industry collapsing, it's the fact that there won't be any uh, fish to, to catch um, or not enough. And here's a chart to show that uh, global meat consumption is going up. Um, certainly in blue is beef, uh, orange is pigs. Uh, in poultry and uh, chickens, that, that's the area where um, it's actually increasing more and more. Um, and then you have some other uh, things. And of course, you know, there have been um, other things coming online like octopus, factory farming, um, those kinds of things. So all of these things together show by the numbers quantitatively that things are getting worse, not better. And all of this, all of this is in the face of evidence for one, the health impact, the negative health impacts that meat eating has on humans, the uh, you know, catastrophic climate impact of, of factory farming, um, the increasing evidence and public information about the animals and how they suffer in factory farms, and as Jonathan showed, the increasing availability of alternatives. So, you know, when you really think about it, there are many different reasons for eating meat. And that is um, something that you have to see as a sort of multifactorial problem. One is cultural embeddedness. It's just, it's, it's in the culture. Um, people serve meat. They, they think it's a, it's a thing to serve to guests. When they go to dinner, there are religious reasons and, and different cultural reasons. It's, it's in the culture. And uh, so we have to recognize that in order to try to find a way to get it out. There's the sensory pleasure. Um, while I don't eat meat, I come from a family of people who uh, eat meat and were butchers. And I used to eat meat when I was uh, much, much younger. 
and it, there's a sensory palate pleasure to it. People like the taste of it. Um, and we, again, that's something we can't ignore. There's the financial investment in the industry. That's a huge one. Um, the fact that, you know, there's so much invested uh, in factory farming industry, it's a juggernaut industrially. And it's, 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 it's a big, it's sort of like, you know, fighting the dragon, the giant dragon. It's, it's huge and has a lot of power. There's also misconceptions about the healthiness of meat. Uh, some people still think meat is healthy and that you need protein and the only way you can get it is from meat. Um, they still think milk is healthy. Um, so this is just a few of the factors that we're dealing with here. But I still want to return to this issue of why the problem of meat eating is, seems to be so intractable. How everybody on this call and you know, thousands of people around the world are making efforts to try to get people to see the issues with eating, killing and eating other animals. And it's particularly factory farmed animals. And yet it's going in the wrong direction. And so we've been looking at maybe inside in the mirror of our own species inside our own brains to figure out what could be driving meat eating that's making it so intractable. So now I want to turn to uh, some interesting, an interesting theory and go deeper. And I now want to turn to um, a book that uh, some of you may have read uh, that came out in 1973. It's a book by the anthropologist Ernest Becker called The Denial of Death. And the question you might be asking is, well, what does this have to do with factory farming and meat eating and killing animals? I think it has a lot to do with it, and I'll explain why. Um, let me go back one minute. Ernest Becker, in this book, The Denial of Death, recognized that human beings have uh, a conscious awareness of our own mortality, that we are the kind of animal who understands that we're going to die someday, and that that frightens us. It causes what he calls death anxiety. And that death anxiety is unconscious. It doesn't hang out with us every day. We don't wake up in a panic every day. Oh my God, we're going to die someday. But it's there in our subconscious, according to Becker. And the question then is, well, what happens to our species when we are aware of this fact? Well, he says that that death awareness, even though it's subconscious, is really intractable and is responsible for driving a lot of the ills of society um, because of the neurosis that's caused by the fact that uh, we are animals who don't want to be reminded that we are. So in the 80s, three social psychologists, Sheldon Solomon, Jeff Greenberg, and Tom Pizinski, got together and decided to test these ideas of Ernest Becker. Um, they figured that if Becker is right, then uh, we should be able to test it and find evidence for it. And the social psychology area that they developed is called terror management theory. Terror, not in terrorist, but the terror of our own mortality and how we manage it. So terror management theory is a theory that asserts that much of human behavior is motivated by anxiety, even unconscious, about personal mortality. And that mortality salience is linked to animality and is a specific driver of attempts to alleviate this anxiety. Speciesism and human exceptionalism are driven by this anxiety 
and express themselves in defenses against being on a par with other animals. So to think of ourselves as being just another animal is to know that we are going to die someday and then you know, our fate is pretty much the same as every other animal. There's nothing special about us. Uh, we're not gonna be saved from our mortal fate. Um, and so we determine, we erect ways, according to this theory, that try to help us convince ourselves that we're not animals. The rallying cry of our species is, I am not an animal, they're animals. I'm something else. We're threatened by recognizing the shared psychology with the other animals, including farmed animals. And we embrace cultural practices and systemic views that reinforce our superiority over them. And I think animal advocacy efforts have largely neglected the core psychological issue here revealed by Becker's theory that we have a a desire, albeit unconscious, to actually separate ourselves from nature. So terror management theory has been supported by over 300 peer-reviewed experiments in over 15 countries. Here are some of the things that have been said about our relationship to nature and other animals. Cultures promote norms that help people to distinguish themselves from animals. Distancing from the rest of the animal kingdom helps humans defend against anxiety associated with awareness of death. Becker said, all systemizations of culture have the same end goal to raise men, humans above nature. And when you think about it, in the legal world, no non-human animal has ever been recognized as a person with even the most basic right to bodily liberty and bodily integrity. There are two uh, researchers who have done a lot of work in this area showing that when you increase uh, someone's awareness of their personal mortality, it turns them against other animals as well as other people. And this, this extends into in-group, out-group relations between people, prejudices, and so forth. Jamie Goldenberg is one such researcher. Um, she's shown repeatedly that human subjects distance themselves from animals as a defense against death anxiety. If you have research subjects read essays that emphasize, uh, that, that read essays that remind one of one's mortality, people prefer essays that show the differences between humans and other animals, not the similarities. These are controlled experimental studies. In another study, participants reminded of death report lower liking for and are less persuaded by reading an article stating that dolphins are more intelligent than humans. Compare the an article that focuses on dolphin intelligence without the comparison. Um, and coming down to the bottom here, mortality salience, meaning the triggering of uh, reminding someone of their, their own uh, death, triggers psychological defenses against both other animals and other humans, extending its reach to the widespread and robust psychosocial phenomena of objectification and subhumanization. A friend of mine, Yuri Lifshin, in Israel has been doing a lot of work in this area. And uh, he has a paper out called The Evil Animal, a terror management theory perspective on the human tendency to kill animals. And what he showed in his 2017 paper is that subjects exposed to subliminal death crimes reported more support for killing of animals than in a control group. So. You can move around how people feel about killing other animals, how they feel about their relationship to other animals, how much they care about other animals, simply by reminding them that they're going to die someday. It's unbelievable, but, but in fact, again, this is a, this is a reliable uh, finding. 
So where do we go from here? It, if this is in fact the case, what do we do about the fact that our species may be so neurotic about our lot in life? We have a level of awareness that says that, you know, we're, gonna, we're all going to die someday and we don't want to think about that and we want to distance ourselves from the other animals because we want somehow to convince ourselves that we're different. What do we do about that? It's, it's subconscious, it's in, it seems intractable. Well, I'm not sure that I can offer you any answers, but I can tell you my thinking about this at this point. That, you know, given all of this, we need to keep going with all of our efforts, but when possible, prioritize other animals' needs before human wants, and especially enact ways that do not depend upon people becoming enlightened and overcoming their deep anxieties and neurosis. I know that it would be wonderful, and we all try to get people to see other animals for who they are the wonderful complex beings who have just as much right to be here as any of us. But we should bear in mind these deep issues that are in the human psyche um, that may work against that. And we should keep that in mind as we are crafting ways to protect the other animals from our own species. So I wanna propose the new three R's and many of you are familiar with the three R's from welfare research in terms of uh, using uh, fewer animals in research um, put forth uh, some time ago by Bertrand Russell. But in the full knowledge of this information about uh, death anxiety and our need to not see ourselves as animals, even though we are. Um, I, I put forth the new three R's. First, recognition of how and why human psychology promotes animal abuse and exploitation. Rights, enforcement of ways to protect other animals from our own species. This is why I work in the rights area um, quite a bit because I just think that not everyone is going to get on board with giving up eating animals or killing animals or caring about animals. So those of us who do care need to find ways to recognize and enforce and codify the rights of other animals so they are protected from us. And finally, reparation, give back whatever we can. And that could be in a number of different forms. We can never give back everything that we've taken from the other animals, but we certainly at this point should be in the business of trying to uh, make as much moral repair as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. That was... Um, that was wonderful. I'm so happy to have you here. I've really admired you for so long, all the speakers. Um, so did anybody have any questions for her? I know I didn't see any in the Q&A feature, but I did see a couple, I'm trying to find them in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if that's, let's see. Thank I think I see one. How about how about veterinary research? Yeah. Well, I mean, veterinary research uh, has to go on. Uh, it can go on um, by doing the least amount of harm as possible um, by using alternatives to to real animals and and so forth. Um, and. I think we have to realize that there's going to be an imperfect uh, compromise kind of situation at any given point that, um, you know, we, we 
if we don't do veterinary research, then obviously we won't have a way to help the animals. Um, but at the same time, we need to do it in as ethical a way as possible. So, um, but I do think, you know, that one of the things that's really interesting is to think about, you know, when think about veterinary research and you think about things like euthanasia, how quick, how easily people sometimes um, feel that euthanasia is, is a really um, it's a decent um, alternative for animals who, who may not be that sick or old. Um, and one wonders about whether or not that's driven by the idea that, you know, their lives aren't as important. We, you know, it, they're not like us. Um, they don't really care. Um, and I think there's a lot of that going on, even in the veterinary field. And we have time for one more question. We've got a bunch now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do we, well, you know, obviously there's a question here, how do we ameliorate our own fear of dying? Many people who have pets work to ensure the care of the pets post their existence. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to, to actually know. And, and I think one of the things that we may need to realize is that uh, it might not be tractable. That, and so as we go forth trying to do as much as we can in the world to protect other animals, it should be in that full knowledge that, that we are dealing with a species, us, that's really you're neurotic and has some subconscious motives that, that are really deep and we need to, it's, I don't know if that's, suggests that we can somehow shed that fear of dying, but I can only believe, I can believe that at least knowing about it can help us as we go forth in knowledge. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again so much, Lori. We really appreciate um, you sharing all of your knowledge with us. I left her website for uh, the Whale Sanctuary Project in the chat if people want to check that out. And now we will move on to Steve Bone. Steve Bone is a climate activist. Thank you. Steve Bone is a climate activist from the UK representing animal rebellion. He started his journey to help save the planet because he wanted his child to experience and love nature and not fear the effects of climate change. This quickly turned into a passion for everyone's child and everyone's future. Steve joined Animal Rebellion as their aims and beliefs closely aligned with his own. He, we believe, or sorry, Animal Rebellion believes that the key solution to climate change is the swift and immediate change to a plant-based food system. Steve is in London, so due to the time difference, he actually pre-recorded his talk, which is entitled Stop the Supply, and his video was a little bit longer than the designated speaking time. So what we're going to do is play the first half, and then you can watch the rest of it on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So now I'm going to do some technology stuff. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Got to make that bigger. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, wonderful. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to listen to everyone's presentations and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. So, why am I here? My name is Steve and I'm here with Animal Rebellion to talk to you about what we're up to here in the UK and a little bit more at the end of our presentation with regards to our upcoming campaign, Stop the Supply of Dairy, where we are going to stop the supply of milk to UK supermarkets across the UK. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end of the conversation. Uh, it's a real, real game changer. So some of you have already heard of Animal Rebellion, and if you haven't, you should already be aware of some of the actions that we've completed, such as very recently, the Jubilee action, where we disrupted disrupted the Horse Guard Parade, forcing the royal family here in the UK to address their land use. 
In Trafalgar Square, we dyed the fountains red to show the blood that's on our government's hands from subsidising the animal agriculture industries and the pandemics this industry causes. We blockaded the distribution site for McDonald's, forcing restaurants to close. Uh, we blockaded Arda, Arla, preventing the dairy supply chain from operating. Recently, we did an MVR Beagles action where we liberated five Beagle puppies from a site in the UK, saving them from uh, torture of animal testing. And this was committed quite spontaneously and with so much love, it engaged the public and animal lovers across the UK and resulted in no charges being raised against our activists. Also, campaigns at a local level with local government councils and schools encouraging them to turn plant-based. High-profile councils and high-profile schools have committed to a plant-based catering service as a direct result of our campaigns. So who are we? Who are Animal Rebellion? We are a mass movement of people using non-violent direct action tactics, civil disobedience, all tactics of rebellion to bring on rapid systematic change. The issue? Animal farming and fishing and the massive effect on climate change they have, the mass extinction of species they cause, the irreversible damage being caused by them and the massive loss to biodiversity across the world. We are a group of volunteers all with one common goal. We want and we believe in a transition from our current broken food system to a new healthy, sustainable and just plant-based future. This would be a start to the end of animal farming on land and fishing at sea. Animal Rebellion recognises we can't first end the climate crisis without first addressing the huge elephant in the room that is animal farming and fishing that causes so many issues. A lot of people here in the UK and across the world have tried using other tactics such as starting petitions, writing to politicians, running for public office to make a change within the system, buying more sustainable products and going vegan to reduce their personal impacts. And all work from previous non-government organisations and non-disruptive activist groups have brought on meaningful change, but we are fast running out of time. Science shows us we will experience the irreversible effects of climate breakdown worse every year from now on. We have seen that despite many meetings and conferences and agreements and accords, these emissions keep rising and climate change keeps getting worse. Temperatures keep getting hotter. So what's left? What do we do? How do we build upon the successes from other groups? and make governments and big businesses and the public listen across the world. We escalate by using the only method we know that works at times like this, mass civil resistance. This is what Martin Luther King said, non-violent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatise the issue that it can no longer be ignored. This was written by Martin Luther King as he actually sat in jail, Birmingham, USA, for using non-violent direct action tactics he used to address the issues of the time, civil rights in America. So we also use disruption that cannot be ignored to highlight the issues of our times with animal farming and fishing and start a negotiation. How do we know this method of disruption will work? Well, quite simply, it has before. Just as I was just saying, the American civil rights movement, you've also got Mahatma Gandhi in India for independence from Great Britain, and even in Great Britain with the suffragettes and the, more recently the gay liberation movement. It works by causing disruption that cannot be ignored. We create a need for the government and big businesses to listen to our demands and make a lasting change. Unfortunately, these movements didn't have the added pressure and the time limits that our cause does. We don't have the hundreds of years it took for India to gain civil independence. Even the civil rights movement and the suffragette movement took years to achieve. We have two to three years, according to the latest IPCC report. 
We need swift and immediate systematic change now. An urgency to take action has never been higher because we are living in the SIPs mass extinction now. We are facing climate catastrophe now. What change do we want to achieve with our upcoming campaign? We want the UK government and big businesses to admit the truth. Animal agriculture, and especially our existing food system that relies so heavily upon factory farming, is a world leading cause of climate change and biodiversity loss. We want the UK government to support our farmers and the fishing communities to move towards stopping animal farming and fishing and start an immediate, just transition to a healthy plant based future. We then want the UK government to commit to rewild or re rewilding this freed up land as part of a wildlife restoration and carbon drawdown program. This in turn will reduce the worst effects of climate change and the worldwide extinction and biodiversity loss all caused by animal farming through deforestation, overfishing and the pollution that the industry creates. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary General of the UN said, the jury has reached a verdict and it is damning. This report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a litany of broken climate promises. It is a file of shame cataloging the empty pledges that puts us firmly on track to on track to an unlivable world and this is the secretary general of the un the top 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 diplomat who is meant to encourage mass cooperation from the governments around the world the top diplomat is saying this we are on a pathway to global warming of more than double 1.5 degrees limit that was agreed in the paris accord some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying and the results will be catastrophic. This is a climate emergency. Yet we are still seeing broken promises. In Brazil, we are seeing legislation that's being pushed through their court systems that's allowing the seizure of indigenous lands for oil and gas, along with the mass deforestation for animal farming only for these same animals to be slaughtered for food, which we as humans don't need to eat. Now we all know the Amazon rainforest is so huge, they're often referred to as the lungs of the earth. The Amazon is amazing, it produces its own climate, which is why it's so special and essential for the planet as a major part of removing carbon from the atmosphere. However, Due to animal farming, this wonderful, magical place is slowly being destroyed. Currently, we as a species have destroyed 18% of the Amazon, and this can never be returned. But if we continue to destroy the Amazon, it won't be able to support itself, as it will no longer be able to generate its own climate. And that's so essential for the wildlife and the nature within its boundaries to survive. This is one of the main tipping points you will hear other experts mention. Um, experts that also say if we destroy around 20% of the Amazon, we will start to see this climate fail. The Amazon will die slowly and become a barren land with no biodiversity, no wildlife, no carbon drawdown. And how much of this Amazon do we destroy a year? 1%. Also, we can farm animals for meat, which we don't even need to eat to survive. So we have two to three years to save the Amazon and in turn the planet. This is one of the reasons why experts are saying we have, we are in an emergency and we have until 2025 to act. This is why a lot of us say we have to act now. But what's going to happen in the future if we continue to do nothing? When we are talking about a rise in average global temperature, this includes an increase over the seas and oceans, and that's 71% of the Earth's surface, and it's covered in water. As land animals, it's mainly the temperature increase on land that we are concerned with, and that temperature increase could be two to three times higher than the average. A two degrees global increase could equate to a seven degrees increase on land. If we continue on the current prediction, that is a three degree increase, 
according to the IPCC, it could even be more, this would be beyond catastrophic. At two degrees alone, and that's predict predicted within the next 10 to 15 years, just over a century away, thousands of millions of people will not be able to live where they are living, where they have lived for thousands of years. Again, a little over a decade away from now. They will have to move, and it's not likely they're going to get up and move politely either. It's going to be a complete nightmare. Parts of the planet are just going to be simply put too hot to live in. We are on course to see approximately one to three billion climate refugees on the move by 2050. We will see more floods, more droughts, more wildfires, more heat waves. Certain areas are just going to become too hot or too wet to live. Soils are going to become too degraded to grow food. And when this hits any of the major food producing regions, we're going to experience worldwide food shortages and mass starvation. We all watch the news and we see daily there are reports of apocalyptic wildfires in Greece, droughts in places like Turkey, Madagascar, and Iraq, unseasonable hot weather in Asia, in recent months in India, a heat wave that broke all records. The year, this year they had no spring, it went straight to summer. The heat wave occurred really early and it caused the massive disruption. The temperature was regularly over 45 degrees C. It was too hot to go out during the day and it remains above 30 degrees at night. We here in the UK complain when it gets to 30 degrees. Now imagine trying to live in that heat, 45 degrees, putting your kids to bed, traveling to work, going to the shops, all the while the heat is unbearable. And unfortunately, this may just be a taste of more to come for India in the future, and not just India as well, other parts in the world. We've seen floods in Europe, very recently, heat waves and massive wildfires in Europe just this week. Record temperatures here in the UK in the last couple of days. We're renowned for wet, bleak, miserable summers. But thanks to climate change, it doesn't look that way anymore. This is the aftermath of the recent Philippines typhoon. And these are just a sign of these events becoming even more frequent and more severe. In California, the reservoir at the Hoover Dam was at its lowest ever recorded level. One expert, or sorry, one report over here said that they are less than 80 foot from disaster. If levels dropped below the intake levels, no electricity would be generated and large parts of California would run dry. We had droughts in Kenya, killing much of the natural wildlife over there. We've experienced wildfires in Australia, USA, Mexico and England. Recently, a glacier broke away from a mountain in Italy, a glacier which had been stable enough to climb on since the Ice Age. And unfortunately for the climbers on the glacier at the time, they didn't make it. The running theme here and the underlying cause is climate change man-made climate change as a result of too much carbon, methane and many other pollutants in our air and sea, the mass deforestation and the melting of the polar ice caps causing sea levels to rise, just to name a few effects we're having. The main culprits for this are burning fossil fuels and why we are here today, the food system, namely animal agriculture. But let's not forget about the animals during these events. We always see the human impact, but rarely reported is the effect these events are having on all of nature's animals. They are the innocent bystanders, bystanders of the horror of climate change that we inflict upon them. Who can forget this report from earlier this year of over 2,000 cattle which died on a factory farm in Kansas, a heat wave caused by climate change. We also see Animals locked in pens and zoo animals drown during massive floods. But again, this isn't reported. 
and animals in nature and off farms are often left to survive wildfires unable to escape their pens or natural habitats. We cannot overlook these forgotten beings anymore. They need our help. They need a transition to a plant-based future now where we can all survive. On top of this, we already know animals are suffering in the animal farming and fishing industries. 1.2 billion land animals are killed every year in the UK. 3 trillion fish globally, that's 5.1 billion in the UK alone. And these numbers don't in include bycatch, the accidental catch of turtles and dolphins and the other beautiful things in the sea. <laughs> In the dairy industry, this means that babies are taken from their mothers, artificial insemination, all the other horrors we are aware of. And it's horrific and it keeps getting exposed again and again. The amount of death and suffering is atrocious. Animals feel and they think they are sentient and they have a right to freedom from being murdered, exploited, forcibly impregnated and caged. Using land animals for Using land for animal agriculture is a leading cause of biodiversity loss and extinction, as we've already seen, but it's also threatening 86% of species that are at risk of extinction already. We are seeing rapid extinction rates spiralling out of control. We are losing beautiful creatures from our world that are never going to be seen again by destroying their habitats. All for animal farming. As vegans, we already care for the animals and we want to save them from this injustice. But we also have to consider how can we do this if the worst effects of climate change continue to escalate? If we can't feed our families, if we can't go outside because it's too hot, we can't save these beautiful creatures. So as fellow vegans, please can I ask that you also support your climate change groups? especially groups like Animal Rebellion, who are actively campaigning to save the future for everyone, animals and the planet. Okay, we're gonna stop the presentation there. And then, like I said, you can watch the rest of it on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Go ahead and stop share. And then we are going to, oops, sorry, give me just a second. We're gonna pop on over to, bios all right wonderful so and i also left um the website for animal rebellion in the chat if people want to check that out you can also look up um steve bone online and connect with him if you have any questions about his presentation and like i said we will have um, his presentation in full on our youtube channel tomorrow as well as this full presentation tonight the full summit okay All right, now we're going to switch over to Avram Rosin. Avram is the founder and executive director of uh, Sedona Forest. He has been vegan since 1999. He started Sedona for Forest in Auroville. I'm so sorry, I'm not great at reading <laughs> these words, but uh, hopefully you can um, fix them once I hand the, it over to you. So he started Sahara Forest in Aurora, Auroraville South India in 2003, together with his family, and they still live there today. Their goal was to do SIVA, uh, selfless service, which means selfless service, and live a life that is a concrete expression of compassion towards all beings. They started doing reforestation and water conservation on 70 acres of severely eroded land, living a low waste vegan lifestyle and inviting volunteers from all over the world to join their efforts. Abram is a member of the Global Restoration Council and a board member of the foundation. Tonight, he will be sharing on how vegan food forests can be a climate appropriate way to feed the world. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I wish you all a very good evening. Um, so, So Sadna Forest, um, 
uh, is an organization, a vegan organization that is trying to uh, create a vegan uh, food forests, uh, a climate uh, appropriate way to uh, feed the world. Um, I'll just uh, explain the situation now a little bit. Uh, if you can see um, the aridity map uh, for 2040, uh, the world is becoming more and more arid. This is 2040. This is 2070. And this is uh, uh, the situation projected for 2100. So the world is becoming drier and more arid. You can see the transformation. And at the same time, we're experiencing uh, uh, a transformation towards um, increased hunger and malnutrition. This is uh, the present situation of um, hunger and malnutrition, or let's say food insecurity. And this is how it's going to be in 2050. And this is in 2080. Yeah. And if you look at uh, the number of uh, malnourished people, you can see the rise that is going to happen uh, before 2030, yeah? Again, to the levels of malnutrition and even more than we had in 2005. So all the decline in malnutrition is gonna be reversed and uh, we're gonna go into uh, severe malnutrition um, in 2030. And that's going to go worse and worse as the years progress. So Sadna Forest uh, now has centers in a few uh, places in the world, in Oroville, India, as uh, Chelsea mentioned, um, uh, in Meghalaya, uh, in Northeast India, in Ansapit in Haiti, in Samburu, Kenya, and in uh, Kunene region uh, in Namibia very soon. And um, I want to explain to you the, the concept of uh, vegan food forests. So here we can see an area in Samburu uh, County, uh, North Kenya, and you can see the houses in which people live, right? These people have a lot of arid lands around their homes, but have actually uh, no food source uh, that is growing on that land. And what we do is we plant a few food producing trees around their home. These food producing trees are drought resistant and, um, and indigenous. And then it looks like this, okay? And then we plant a few more and it looks like this. And a few more, and a few more, and a few more. So this is the kind of transformation that vegan food forests can create. So it's a transformation from uh, food insecurity to food security, because now this hut has so many food producing trees around it. And at the same time, it's a transformation towards um, a greener world. So we are achieving uh, those two goals in one, in one go. This is how we started. This is the land when we started in South India, in Oroville. And this is how it looks now. And this is the kind of transformation that we are offering to do all over the world uh, with vegan food forests. Diverse indigenous food bearing and drought resistant because droughts are becoming more and more frequent. So um, how, how can we do this? How can we create vegan food forests? We, we train people in water conservation first to capture the water on the land so that the, the land can actually grow for us. Um, doing on contour swales, this is a trench and a hump of a swale. Uh, that's how it looks. Um, after the rain, and that's how it looks after five years. All the trees, all these trees are actually grown by themselves from natural regeneration, even without planting. But when we plant food forests, uh, we control, of course, the the, the species. Uh, we do gabions. It's another way to uh, slow down water. Uh, basically, we apply the triple S's: slow, spread, and sink uh, water. An earth dam, 
that captures a large amount of water. And this is, uh, for instance, a place where mining was done, uh, soil mining was done, and uh, we transformed it into this. Okay. Um, another example, this is a keyhole garden uh, where we plant just around this uh, keyhole. And then after one month, it looks like this. Another example, um, a demonstration plot in Haiti. Actually, this is a picture I took in 2010 um, in April. And then uh, 60 days later, with just water conservation, uh, no watering at all, transformed into this. And then another uh, uh, one and a half, two years. And it's like this, yeah, growing food. So uh, we have a nursery where we grow the species that are food producing. Uh, we don't use animal compost at all. And we don't grow trees for fodder. It's a completely vegan food forest, both in terms of the inputs and in terms of the uses. Our team goes tree planting. Uh, this is an example in Ansapit, but our teams all over the world do the same thing, go every day and plant those indigenous food producing species around people's homes. So we do tree planting. This is one of the ways that we uh, plant trees. It's uh, planting above the ground because in some places it is very, very difficult to dig into the ground. Um, we use a wick irrigation bottle. This bottle enables uh, uh, water to go directly to the roots. It has this wick, this cotton rope here, that can lead the water directly to the roots of the plants. And then there is no evaporation of water. There is no salinization of the soil because when water evaporates, it leaves uh, salt behind. So um, this is a very powerful way to save water and to use uh, uh, so much less water than we would use by just watering around the tree. It's equivalent to drinking through the mouth versus uh, drinking above our head. Uh, water would trickle anyway, but it won't be as effective as if we drink directly into the mouth. And this is uh, um, the mount of the, the trees, the roots. Uh, this is uh, a mobile reforestation unit, a big truck that carries compost and personnel and, and uh, um, trees, seedlings, and goes to plant in different villages. The trees are planted around people's homes in areas where there no, were no trees before at all, and they provide uh, nutrients that are sometimes very relevant to this situation of the uh, person or the family. For instance, in this case, it's a Moringa tree in Kenya, Moringa stenopetala, which provides iron uh, to this uh, lady. The leaves are very rich in iron. She can take um, a handful of leaves and put it in anything she's cooking. And then she has uh, a wonderful source of iron. Uh, the anemia is uh, reversed and um, her children are born much healthier much heavier in weight and uh, at the right time, not prematurely, and it can change the whole faith of the family. Uh, fruit trees growing in an area where trees have uh, not grown for since deforestation for uh, dozens or sometimes hundreds of years. Um, these are mayanat seeds. Uh, mayanat trees are trees that we grow in Haiti. Uh, for the local community in uh, Ansapit, with the local community in Ansapit. And you can see uh, we have a um, solar mill uh, where we can mill the uh, dried um, mana uh, seeds and then have the flour and people can bake bread or chapatis or uh, biscuits uh, for their family. And this milling, this solar milling is of course done uh, like all our services, uh, free of cost. Um, when we give uh, free services, we also say that vegan, veganism is kindness. It's not just kindness towards animals, it's kindness towards people. Um, and that uh, uh, differentiates uh, this activity from other uh, for-profit activities. Um, this is how we live. Uh, while we do this reforestation effort, uh, we live in huts built from uh, local and natural materials, 
Um, we have, a, a, of course, a vegan kitchen in each one of our uh, centers uh, serving a huge amount of uh, vegan food uh, uh, for free, of course. Um, rocket stoves where we uh, minimize the amount of firewood we use in order to uh, protect the forest, not just by planting it, but by uh, using less of it for uh, combustion, for, for cooking. Uh, we live only on solar energy. All the uh, centers are powered uh, only on solar and wind energy, no non-renewable energy. Uh, human powered generator. Uh, where we can uh, generate electricity from pedaling. Uh, we save a lot of water by using uh, this method of um, uh, hand washing, uh, just a cup with a little hole where water can just uh, trickle down and uh, reduce the amount of water used very, very much. Um, sustainable transportation, like this uh, solar e-rickshaw that has panels. We basically strip the roof off and put panels, and now it uh, uh, can drive as long as uh, it wants to without uh, charging from any grid. Um, we are substance-free, so uh, not just that we are more aware, but we are also um, using uh, land for better uses instead of uh, growing uh, tobacco or or drugs or uh, alcohol. We are using land for forests. Um, land use is a very, very important uh, point for us. We have daily visits from uh, uh, groups and individuals. About 50 to 60,000 people visit our center in India uh, annually. You can see them. Uh, we give tours of the land all the time. Uh, every Friday, we have an eco film club where we show uh, environmental film, uh, serve a uh, free vegan uh, dinner, and uh, give a tour of the whole uh, project. Uh, the tea hut where people can drink vegan uh, uh, tea and ladus, uh, sweet um, balls. Um, a potluck, a vegan potluck every Saturday. Um, everything is designed to bring people into the forest, in touch with veganism and in touch with nature. Um, we host free vegan weddings, uh, which is um, a chance for many people, not just for the couple who is usually vegan, but for the all the guests, uh, two, three, 400 and more guests to get introduced to uh, a vegan diet and its uh, impact. Um, we work a lot with children uh, in a project called Children's Land where uh, children are introduced to uh, the environment. And we have uh, an animal sanctuary where we uh, give a wonderful life to, to animals. Um, and we treat them as, as our, our friends without using any input from them, not the dung, not the milk, not the meat, nothing, but just a pure heart-to-heart uh, -heart connection with the animals. And for many people, it is the first time that they have ever um, experienced something like this. Uh, this is where you can uh, find us on um, YouTube and Instagram. Um, we're called Sadhana Forest, and this is our website. And I wanted to thank you very much for your attention to this presentation and uh, to ask you if you have any questions, if there's anything you would like to, to know more about the option of uh, growing vegan food forest for this, uh, to feed this world. There are about 130 million people that are suffering from severe hunger right now um, and could benefit from vegan food forests because we have plenty of, uh, they have plenty of land around their homes. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I can, um... I want to tell you from the chat, everybody is absolutely blown away by the magnificent space that you've created and the beauty and just the sense of community that you foster. One question we have is a clarification on what human ore is. Okay, uh, human ore is uh, uh, composed from humans. Uh, so uh, when we go to the uh, toilet, uh, we actually produce a very valuable uh, compost. And if our uh, toilets are designed uh, properly, 
uh, if there are dry composting toilets, they enable us to um, uh, harvest. Uh, for instance, in Sadna Forest in Orville, we harvest between 10 and 15 tons a year of uh, human manure, of uh, uh, human produced compost. And uh, uh, this compost is very uh, potent, very, uh, and it's free. Yeah. Instead of, um, uh, you know, using uh, our waste in a um, sewage system, which is a huge transportation system uh, that uses clean water in order to transport our waste from one place to another, we just use it safely and locally, aging it for one year before we use it on the land so that it's completely free of bacteria and viruses and it's uh, um, a powerful compost. Thank you so much for explaining that. So we have two more questions and they're kind of similar. Um, one is asking, can you do you have a program or can you advise other people in other countries wanting to do the same? And in the same sense, somebody is asking for help to create overseas projects. So it's kind of the same. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, we are expanding. So uh, this year we'll be starting three more centers of Sadna Forest in uh, Meghalaya, in Northeast India. And next year in 2023, another center in uh, Kunene uh, region in Namibia. I've just uh, come back from there a few days ago, um, uh, working with the Himba tribe to create. We're open to more countries, of course. And uh, for those countries that we can't reach, uh, please reach out to us and come to our centers for training. We're very happy to train you for free. Um, uh, and uh, we have now quite a spread. So uh, you should be able to find a center that is not so far from where you are. Um, yeah, and we are hoping always to discuss with people uh, different collaborations and partnerships. So please contact me at any time. Uh, you can find all our contact details on sadnaforest.org. Yeah. Wonderful. And I did share that website a couple of times in the chat for people who want to contact them. Um, last question. Do you know of any similar organizations that are doing this kind of work in the U.S.? Or do you have plans to come to the U.S.? Uh -huh. We have many plans, but uh, we have two limiting factors. One is the funding and the other one is long term volunteers. We're a volunteer organization and all our management is um, volunteer volunteers who are ethical vegans. So all our projects are managed by ethical vegans. And um, uh, we need more of you to join us in order to uh, uh, do more and hopefully to come to the US too. The US is going through massive, as you've seen on the aridity projections, is going through a massive uh, deforestation and uh, aridization, uh, degradation. And um, it's very relevant for us to start a center there and we hope to do it. I don't know of any other vegan reforestation organizations in the US. I know of small projects doing a small vegan permaculture but I don't know of anyone that does uh, vegan reforestation on a, on a bigger uh, social sort of scale. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That's all the questions we have. We really appreciate you tuning in. I know, is it morning for you or? Um, it's uh, 4.41 in the morning where I am, but it's, it's totally fine. I'm very happy to be with you anytime. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next time and to following your ever expanding projects. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. All right. Well, I hope everybody is enjoying the summit thus far and is very motivated and energized to get more involved in the movement now. Next, Serena Farb and I will be sharing about a new project of Project Animal Freedoms, the Vegan Climate March. This grassroots day of action happening on May 6th of next year, 2023, will bring cities from all over the world together to call for a vegan paradigm shift and the immediate development and transition to a plant-based veganic food system. So before we share more about the march and how you can get involved, I'd love to first introduce my fellow lead organizer and co-founder, Serena um, Farb. Serena is a vegan educator, public speaker, and liberation activist working to make the world a better place for all beings. Being born and raised vegan in Kansas taught Serena to think for herself and stand for justice, even when it's unpopular. Today, Serena focuses on combining heart and science to empower individuals to think critically and see past corporate propaganda and to live ethically. 
Her projects include blogging, creating videos on her YouTube channel and Instagram, Born Vegan, and hosting the Science is Gray podcast. Serena is currently serving on the Plant-Based Network Advisory Committee, is a member of the American Vegan Society Speakers Bureau, and is the co-founder, flagship March organizer, and head of sponsorships for the upcoming Vegan Climate March. Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, I'm so excited that you are my co-organizer for this project. Um, and did you already introduce yourself or... Okay, so then I'm, I'm introducing Chelsea as my co-organizer. Chelsea V. Davis is the founder of Veggies Do It Better, which focuses on social and food justice and vegan advocacy, and the Roaring Vegans, an online organic and fair trade chocolate and gift shop. And Chelsea has organized hundreds of virtual and in-person events, protests, marches, veg fests, international health and animal rights conferences, summits, speaker panel, activism tours, fundraisers, um, and more. She regularly speaks on effective communication and activism, climate change, animal rights, plant-based cooking, and I think you get the picture. <laughs> um, her focus today is community building, brought, uh, and it brought her to start the Vegan Night Market in Portland in 2019, and she also co-founded the Animal Rights Collective of Portland in 2020. And Chelsea is also the admin of the largest vegan Facebook group in the Pacific Northwest and a regular contributor to Unchained TV, as well as on the advisory board of the Counter Cult Coalition. She's active in several animal rights and social and food justice campaigns. So her latest project, along with myself and Project Animal Freedom, is our International Vegan Climate March that will be taking place on May 6th, 2023. Um, you can learn more about Chelsea's work at Veggies Do It Better and some of her other work. Um, but we're really excited to talk to you today about this project. You've heard um, a lot of great speakers and I was tuning in for a lot of that. And one of the things you might have come away with is just how urgent and important it is that we do everything we can as soon as possible to act on the climate and ecological crisis. So for a little bit of background, I hosted an online climate diet summit in 2020 prior to the pandemic and had kind of had the idea of you know, using that as a launching point and then trying to do some sort of in-person vegan climate action. Because, you know, around that time, there were a lot of the youth climate strikes, the Fridays for Future marches. There was a ton of momentum and action, um, largely, you know, motivated by Greta Thunberg in the UK, and not UK, in uh, Sweden. And, um, you know, there was a lot of momentum going. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And so now here we are. And this is basically the idea that we need to take all of that momentum, all of the in-person marches, the enthusiasm for doing something now, today, to combat the climate crisis, but putting a really clear demand with that. So one of the you know, things that I kind of had a, you know, was critical of with the other climate marches is a lot of them were just kind of saying, do something, the government needs to take action, but didn't have any clear specific goals, weren't actually giving people the tools to change things in their own life or, you know, where, where that change really needed to happen urgently. So that's where the vegan climate march comes in. And we basically want to take that energy and put clear demands on it for one, we want governments to take action, particularly the US government and stop subsidizing animal industry, animal agriculture. So we need to level the playing field first and stop propping up these horrible destructive industries. And then two, call on individuals that can to immediately go vegan and take that personal stand and that personal action for the climate. And then three, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations to adopt the plant-based treaty. And so if those of you are maybe familiar with it, it's a project of the SAVE movement where they're kind of expanding upon some of the IPCC goals and these international treaties, but 
again, calling for some specific, clear demands for a plant-based food system. So we're supporting that project as well and basically saying any institution, governments, local governments, city governments, um, nonprofits, endorse that and make your vegan statement, you know, come out with your policy, make sure that your events and projects that you're putting on support a plant-based food system, that they have vegan food at your events, that you are promoting and endorsing that. So those are kind of our three demands and it's going to be a worldwide day of action. And we hope to have, you know, um, hopefully more than a hundred cities around the world participating in this with a goal of really truly showing the government, um, governments around the world, companies around the world, the media, that we are a force to be reckoned with and that we need an immediate transition to a not just a plant-based food system, but we're actually calling for a veganic food system. So this is similar to some of the works that Anna Forest is doing where we're combining the sustainability and climate principles of needing to go plant-based with the ethics as well. So we can't have, you know, animal-based regenerative agriculture regardless of how sustainable that theoretically might be. Because, you know, I think a lot of us here, we care about total liberation. We care about justice for all humans, all beings. And that's another thing that a lot of the mainstream climate movement is leaving out is they're talking about climate justice. They're talking about including all people. And then of course, forgetting our fellow earthlings, forgetting the non-human animals that we share this planet with, who are not only being deeply harmed by the climate crisis, as Lee Hall pointed out earlier, but are also, we are harming them with our horrific industries that are in turn causing this ecological crisis. So we have to extend our circle of compassion to all living things. And we are building that right into the foundation of the climate march, the, the vegan climate march that we are organizing here. So that's kind of the background and where we're coming from. And then of course, the other thing to mention with veganic agriculture is we really value truly sustainable and ethical food systems. So not the monocrops, not large industrial agriculture. We want to try and make the food system as ethical for everyone, including the humans in it, the land, the soil, you know, all of that. So Chelsea, would you like to jump in and add some more details about how people can get involved? I'd love to, I'm gonna check. I don't know if you wanna check that question while I'm talking. So oh, yeah, yeah, so we're so excited. This is going to be a worldwide international um, day of impact. And this is a wonderful opportunity for those watching, or maybe if you know a local organization, a grassroots organization, organization in your city or nearby um, that might be interested in organizing a march. I just put the um, organizers sign up form in the chat. And then with that information, we'll be contacting people probably at the end of August, early September to start organizing things. We're hoping to have, you know, hundreds of cities participate. Our goal is to really support the organizers in doing this. We understand that doing a march can be very daunting. Um, and so we also have an opportunity if you would prefer to do a rally, that is totally great too. Um, but we will be here to help you every step of the way through different resources and workshops, everything from nonviolent communication to uh, how to be a police liaison, to um, you know, how to figure out what your route should be. We're also going to be doing at least monthly Zoom calls with all of the organizers and have a closed Facebook group. So we really wanna make sure that everybody is um, you know, supported to the best of their our ability. And um, also that we have a, a number of cities around the world that are representing because this is gonna be an amazing collective um, impact. And the really exciting thing that we wanna announce is we're not only partnering with climate healers, but we're partnering with Unchained TV. And so we will have correspondence at all of the major marches and rallies, um, taking video and creating, probably I'm hoping like a mini documentary that will be on the new Unchained app. And if people haven't checked that out, I definitely recommend it. And one other thing that I'll add to another sort of motivating factor in this March is that so many large vegan and animal rights events happen primarily on the coast here in the U.S. And we wanted to do something that brought a little bit more focus to the middle of the country, to the Midwest, 
where lots of these animal agribusiness operations also are occurring and having a devastating impact on the climate and planet, um, and where there's a lot of people that are living in close proximity to them. So with that and with Project Animal Freedom's location in St. Louis, we are also going to have a flagship march, and there'll be more details coming on that but we will have a number of speakers, some of the people um, that were involved in the summit today, and that we will really be trying to draw as many people as possible to attend our flagship march in St. Louis to really show the country, show everybody that there is a presence in the Midwest. There are people here who care about this, and that needs to be a focal point in this you know, transition to a veganic food system, we have to remember the Midwest. So that's another piece. Again, more details coming soon and hopefully our website will be up in the next couple of weeks. So be on the lookout for some announcements about that. And um, we'll have a lot more details there. And really, if you want to get involved or know anybody who wants to get involved, we are really looking for the regional organizers and we will, as Chelsea said, we'll provide resources. We can help you even if you've never done this before, but you're really motivated and want to try this out. We'll have lots of resources to help you with that. And we have a couple of questions in the chat. Is there anywhere we can see where cities have already signed up? So we don't have that many cities signed up yet because we this is kind of the big announcement tonight. Um, and then once the website is up, we will have a really... Uh, beautiful graphic and a list of all of the cities and the different countries that are participating. What we recommend doing right now is if you are interested in organizing, go ahead and uh, fill out that sign up form. And then once the cities kind of start to come together, we will group you with the other organizers within your city so you can, all can work together. And then another question was, if I don't wanna be an organizer, how can I learn more about it? And we recommend following us on Facebook and Instagram at Vegan Climate March. And then like uh, Serena was saying, our website will be up soon. And then we'll be announcing cities as they um, sign up and and also you know more details, more details about sponsorships. I don't know, Serena, do you wanna talk a little bit about sponsorships? We will have a bunch of sponsorship opportunities and those will be listed on our website as well. So um, we have everything from grassroots level, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, but you want to help us promote the march and really support it on social media as well. We have sponsorships that start at that level going up to, you know, if you really want to support even like an entire city getting all of their banners and graphics and materials, then, you know, you can help sponsor that. Um, so that will all be on the website as well. And, you know, answering the previous question too, there'll be lots of volunteer and just March opportunities. So once, once again, once our website is up, we have a map on there. And so you will be able to see all the locations. They'll be updated on that map. They'll be updated on social media. Um, on Facebook, we'll have events, um, you know, for every city, we'll have a, a Facebook event. So you'll be able to check on there and we'll add those as more organizers step up. So... Uh, lots of opportunities to get involved, regardless of your monetary or time level of commitment. Um, you'll be able to get involved however you'd like. Exactly. And it's going to take everybody to get involved to make this the impact that we want to see and that we need to yeah. see. Yeah. We, we want questions? the whole community turning out for this. We want to get as many people as possible, just so that there's bodies, just so that the media and our local and city governments can see there are people who care about this. This is what the people want. This is what we need for, you know, change to happen. Are there any other questions? We've got a couple more minutes if people are curious about any aspect of the march. We're also hoping to be at the new animal rights conference in October. So if people are uh, planning on going to that, then you can come up to our table and say hi to us and learn more about the march that way. And then like we were saying, definitely check out our social media, Vegan Climate March on Instagram and Facebook. We'll be giving updates when the website is live and also updates on more ways to get involved and connect with people and organizers in your city. Yeah. And I'll throw this in too. This is about the previous speaker, but um, I've been to Sedona Forest in Haiti too. So 
highly recommend their work and love the other solutions that have been presented here tonight as well. Lots of ways to get involved and make a difference and take action. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up and turn it over to Kyle, the executive director of Animal Freedom. I just want to, Animal Freedom Project, I just want to say first that I'm really appreciative of everybody who attended today, all of the amazing speakers. It's been really phenomenal to be a part of. Um, and I want to remind everybody if you came in late or maybe if you're watching this later and you missed the first part, you can watch it on replay on our Facebook page, Project Animal Freedom, and then it will be on the YouTube channel tomorrow. And we will also post that on both of our social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram links to the YouTube video and channel. So if you haven't subscribed yet, we definitely recommend that. We're going to be adding more videos um, very soon. It is growing right now and we're excited to continue that and um, just really look forward to continuing the fight with all of you and to see you all at the Vegan Climate March in May. Absolutely. Uh, it is my honor to help wrap up this event and I would like to begin by thanking everyone who participated tonight, starting with you, Chelsea. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for stepping in over the past couple of weeks and coordinating a lot of the details behind the scenes, as well as leading tonight's meeting. Uh, thank you, Serena, uh, as well for your very committed work on our Worldwide Vegan Climate March. It's a truly exciting opportunity, which I'll talk a little bit uh, very briefly about uh, as just a reminder during my little segment right here. I would also like to acknowledge all our speakers, especially the two who joined us at like four or 5 a.m. in the morning. Thank you so very much for joining us that late and in, in, uh, that early rather. Um, so since this is a Project Animal Freedom event and since one of our goals is ending the climate and ecological emergency facing all life on earth, I would like to go through a few different ways that you can help our organization from volunteering to donating uh, to shopping on our online store. Now we have a special offer that I'll get to in just a few minutes, but let's go ahead and start with how you can get involved as a volunteer with our organization. And I promise I will not take very long. I am going to share my screen and let me know if you can see it. Can we see it? Excellent. And I'm going to click slideshow and here we are. So there are plenty of opportunities to get involved with our organization as a volunteer. Chelsea and Serena uh, talked about our Worldwide Vegan Climate March. And Chelsea, if you don't mind, throw that link in there again for the sign up form because I, I just feel it's such an amazing opportunity to be part of a global day of action that's going to truly champion uh, veganism as an environmental imperative and hopefully make an impact on the broader environmental and social justice movement in uh, mainstreaming the recognition that veganism is a necessary element of a comprehensive uh, climate and social justice solution. You also have the opportunity through our organization uh, to become a chapter organizer. We're working to build a fully vegan Midwest by 2056 through a strategic chapter-based system. Currently, we have six active chapters with our newest chapter being in Cleveland, Ohio. And as a chapter organizer, we'll provide you with various resources for how you can most effectively uh, organize and mobilize your community in a variety of events from potlucks, demonstrations, protests, all the way on down to large dinners, uh, even festivals and other ways that you can make an impact in your local community. Uh, we also have the, uh, a number of internship opportunities available. Uh, no matter what your skill set is, we can find some work for you. We meet uh, every Monday at 6 p.m. CST. If you can't meet during those times, I'm always happy to arrange a time outside standard meeting times to meet with you. Mostly it's college students, but we've had some people in their 30s participate as well. So you don't have to be a college student in order to participate in our internship program. And then finally, you can consider joining uh, our, um, our board, either at the local level or even the global level. The global level oversees all our operations, whereas the local level would oversee the operations of a specific chapter. For example, like Project Animal Freedom Dash St. Louis. And of course, you can just go to our website, projectanimalfreedom.org slash volunteer, and we have a volunteer form for you to fill out. 
Now I would like to talk about another way to support our mission that's extremely important uh, because we have a big dream building a fully vegan Midwest by 2056 and big dreams come with even bigger budgets. The reality is that as we take on more and larger projects, as we launch more chapters across the Midwest, as our organization grows and expands, our operating expenses keep growing as well. And uh, we are in a position where we always need more funding, particularly in the form of monthly recurring donations. And I want to briefly review why it's so important to invest in animal rights organizations like Project Animal Freedom. Here's a graphic that some of you may have already seen. It's uh, often cited in uh, effective altruist uh, literature as it relates to the animal rights movement. And on the left-hand side, you can see the number of animals used and killed and the vast majority of, of animals used and killed in the US are killed in factory farm and slaughterhouse conditions. In fact, 99.6% of all animal deaths are occurring in those environments, excluding uh, aquatic species whose numbers of death are so great they're measured only in tons. Uh, yet, only 0.8% of all the funding goes to farmed animals who are the 99.6% of the animals being killed. Meanwhile, 0.03% um, of all the animals killed are killed in companion animal shelters, uh, you know, dogs and cats. Uh, the movement overhaul, the animal protection movement is underfunded and it will always be underfunded until every animal lives safe, happy and free. Uh, but uh, the animal rights movement is particularly crucially underfunded. And by donating to an organization like Project Animal Freedom, you can help uh, close that deficit. In fact, there are a couple other ways to frame this issue. For every one animal who dies in a, a shelter, over 3,300 animals die in a factory farm or slaughterhouse environment. And if you do the math, for every $82.50 donated to an uh, animal welfare organization, just $1 is donated to an animal rights organization, which is such a shame because animal rights organizations strive for the liberation of all beings. Uh, we should be receiving much more funding than we currently have available to us. With that said, I would like to get to a special offer. Um, again, we really need your donations. And tonight and through the end of next Thursday, we will be accepting donations as part of our uh, special offer. And it works as follows. If you make a one-time donation, you'll get one entry for every $20 you donate. And if you make a monthly donation, you'll get five entries for every $20 a month that you sign up to donate. And the prizes are as follows. For the first place prize, you get two free shirts and one book. Uh, it could be either Lee Hall's um, On Their Own Terms, Animal Liberation in the 21st Century, or Jonathan Balcom's What a Fish Knows. For the second prize, you get one free t-shirt from our online shop in addition to uh, whatever book you might like. And then finally, for the third prize, you get one free t-shirt. And you can just go right here to projectanimalfreedom.org slash donate. And you have two options right here. You have donate once and donate monthly. This is what our donate monthly page looks like. Please select $20 if you can, because we have a lot of $5 a month donors, but we could really use $20 a month donors because you're doing the work of four $5 a month donors. And we really need this sustainable, reliable income to help get us through month through month, especially as large donations that we received at the end of last year and the beginning of this year dwindle. We really need that, that monthly income. Uh, then finally, one more way you can support us is by shopping on our online shop at projectanimalfreedom.org shop. We have awesome designs for you to choose from. Right now, we still have our pride collection up. If you want some of these pride t-shirts, act quickly, limited time only, and I'll be removing them within the next week or two. Uh, most of them, uh, these two will stay. Uh, then we have all sorts of other designs. Uh, this was very popular at St. Louis Pride Fest. Um, I don't eat homies, bacon makes me sad. And another one of my favorites, weed is my favorite vegetable. So we have all sorts of amazing designs at projectanimalfreedom.org slash shop. And all profits from our t-shirt sales support our mission of building a fully vegan Midwest by 2056. Uh, I wanna thank you all again for joining us for our second annual Vegan Climate Summit. We're going to uh, put this on for the third year this coming year. It will likely take place on a weekend. So 
uh, afternoon central time so that people in Europe and elsewhere don't have to get up at uh, 4, 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I'm just so grateful to you, Chelsea, Serena, to all of our speakers, to all of our attendees. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been a true pleasure to see you and to fight for the future of our planet. Um, everything is at stake. And we, as I like to say, the surest way to change nothing is to do nothing, but the surest way to change everything is to do everything you can. And that's what we must do if we are to maximize our chances of a livable future for all life on earth. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening.